No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. It is 540 for the record. Okay. <laughs> and we're here today with Masika. How are you? How are you doing? It's actually Masika Kalisha. Oh, so, but, but you said it great. I have to say the full thing. Yeah, like Angelina Jolie it goes together. Okay, well, if you're going to talk about me, I want you to call me Adam Grand Mason. Wait, who? Well, Ad- that's my last I'll name. I'll say the whole thing. Say it again. Adam Grand Mason. Adam Grand Adam Grand Mason. G R A N D M A I S O N. Grand Mason. That's a secret I in there that nobody ever expects. That's amazing. I mean, it, it, we can just I can do it. You're into it. A lot of people don't like it. A lot of people think it's like kind of creepy and white supremacy. Ah, is it? No. Yeah, I didn't get that. It's just French for big house. <laughs> Which, you know, I have like an okay sized house. I mean, now, it's, so. it's your name. You, you can't help that. Well, when I was living in. A little apartment. That's what we keep. Yeah, me that going. was probably funny. How could I fail with the last name like this? <laughs> like when people say you're a home wrecker, but you guys live in an apartment, right? Yeah. I'm an apartment wrecker. Yeah, you oh. mean you could be. And it's like if you have roommates. Oh yeah. You remember the roommate part of your life? Did you have a roommate? I've part had of one life? roommate my entire life, and that lasted four months. What age were you? Twenty six. And what were you doing in your life at that point? Um, I had just moved to L.A. Mm. Uh, from Atlanta. So, you know, I'm like moved across the country by myself. My own money. You had a roommate. Yeah. So one of my best friends, still one of my best friends to this day, she was nice enough to give up her one bedroom and we moved into a two bedroom together. Mm. And um, that was my first and last experience with a roommate. You hated it? I'm not going to say I hated it. Um, I've just always lived by myself. Right. So it was like one thing I did hate, though, she <laughs> uh, she would blast like Celine Dion <laughs> See, just blasting morning, music in general. Like, <laughs> as soon as you have a roommate, just playing loud music becomes like a very complicated decision. No, so we like loud music. It's just like Celine Dion. Like, yeah. really? Like, I want to ratchet. Right. Yeah, she has a Celine Dion tattoo on her wrist. It's just, she's different. But it's just like in general. if people, Like in college, like I only, I only went away to college for one year, but I had a roommate who would very loudly play video games while I was sleeping oh, that's sometimes. Just rude. Insane. That's and just rude. he was one of these kids. We're talking 2003. He would scream the N word at the screen when he would die in the game or whatever. And that is ultimately why we uh, fell apart, is because we ended up getting in a huge fist fight over that exact thing. Which well, I'm that's not, a good reason. I'm not saying that's like virtue signal and be like, oh, look how, how, <laughs> how anti racist I am. But that is no, actually what good, happened. That's a good yeah. reason, though. That right. is a good reason. It kind of comes off a little. Ish, so I'll be honest with you. Well, I don't have one to suck, so so thankfully I didn't take it that way. That's so a move. <laughs> that, that's a move that I would do though. Go on, go on a date with a black girl and just start telling her all the like anti racist stuff the, I've done the, in my all life. All the ways I stood up for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, one time I uh, fought in the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever dated a black girl? Uh, I wouldn't say dated. Had sex with sure, yeah. Nothing to never never really mm-hmm. hit that stride, which is a, I, I live with that shame every day. Oh, no, I don't think it's shame. It's just, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. I just feel like that would have been what could have like catapulted my career to the next level. It'll make you or break you. There is a BET. <laughs> there's BET. There's Zeus. There's the Shade Room. There, <laughs> there aren't really like Armenian equivalents. I mean, if, well, there I guess should that's be. true, but the Kardashians have taken over. I know, but it hasn't really materialized into like the general public caring about Armenian life. You know, I think that's a good thing and a bad thing because unfortunately with the networks and the, the station stuff you name, that's they're known for being ratchet. I know. They're known for being ignorant and they're known for being stereotypical of what you would think black people are, not, you know, what what most black people really are. So it's cool that, you know, we have taken over so many things, but I just hate that we're known for all of this ratchet stuff. That's, mm. that's, ugh. Did so. you, but okay, you're somebody who probably went into the love and hip hop experience with a lot of preconceived assumptions about it yeah. and how it, you know, cause it, it even being around for a couple of years, it was pretty obvious that this is basically like entertaining, right. but it is really probably to the detriment of black people in right. general, right? Right, right. Now, when I started, of course, I've, I've seen, you know, Love and Hip Hop Atlanta and I, in New York at the time. But, you know, being in my 20s, not really knowing what's going on, I'm really thinking, oh, this is really what's happening in these people's lives. You know, I'm thinking that this is just cameras following people around and that this is what's happening. Hmm. I'm thinking, oh, I wouldn't do that. And, oh, well, why are they doing that? Not realizing that 
it was all controlled. Listening and, to you talk about this to Sharp made me fully realize what that shit must be like. Yeah. Because I've had the same thought yeah. of like, well, they can't misrepresent me. Like, I, I'm my own person. Oh, like, yeah. I'm not going to do anything <laughs> lame, whatever. But then obviously, like, through editing, through whatever, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just so easy to make you into whatever they want. Yeah. Right? And even, let's say, even without, like, the super crazy editing, because um, one thing, you know, like I did, I did mention on the show with Sharp, Growing up, hip-hop did the craziest edits. Love right, Hip-hop yeah. didn't do those crazy edits so much, but they put you in the crazy situations. And it's like, okay, you're filming, you know, with who they bring. They take you to the place. Half the time, you don't know where you're going. Mm. You don't know who's going to be there. You're just kind of thrown into the situation. So it's like, even when it, you are making your own choices, you're making your own choices based off of this little box that you're put in. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, when I went into Love & Hip Hop, I I thought it was going to be something that I could control. Right. Um, but, you know, you, I, you can only control so much, but I still tried my best. Um, but, you know, at that time, too, I was young, 26 years old, you know, no kids, trying to make it in Hollywood. Mm. I just moved here, shipped my car, Any shipped Any opportunity, stuff. you're going to look on the exactly. bright side. Exactly, and yeah. I'm like, you know what, hey, cool, I'll, I'll run with it. I'll roll with the punches. We'll, we'll do it. You want me to get crazy? Let's get crazy. Ah, you know, right. and you know, then it gets to the point where, you know, once you have children and you have things to lose and things like that, where it's like, okay, I was doing this, but now I can't do that. So let me ask you this. Is there a sense that when your career involves love and hip hop, or at least, especially when it begins that way, is that kind of like a scarlet letter that is just kind of, it brands you for life? Like, could Beyonce have become Beyonce if she had done a couple seasons of Love & Hip Hop? Oh, yeah. Hip -Hop, you think? Oh, yeah. You don't hear anyone categorize Cardi B with Love & Hip Hop anymore. Yeah, but she also has, like, a goofy, fun, like, thing about her. So right. it's kind of like, like, I don't know if she was, like, super serious as an artist. Never. No, no. The Love & Hip Hop thing kind of is in conflict with that, right? Which is very true. What, I, what I've learned from the position that I'm in, people remember your biggest negative. Right. And to you outdo it with something so grandiose mm. that they're forced to talk about that. Right. You know, so even though I've done things that have made me way more money, I've done things that are, you know, way higher in the hierarchy than love and hip hop. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest negative that people know me from. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's, it's OK. I don't mind if that's what you remember me as mm. at this point. That just means maybe I got to do a little work a little harder. Right. Or if that's what I'm after, if I'm after the, the, the public acknowledgement, sure. But I've accomplished so much more than that behind the scenes that, you know, it is what it is. It's just when people like your boy, your son, Sharp, try to put me in a box <laughs> that I don't fit in it at how this you, point. How do you feel about how that interview went? You know, honestly, when he stormed out and did the walk of shame, um, <laughs> like a bad bitch does in the morning after she got fucked. Um, sorry, I'm yeah. trying not to curse. Lord, oh. put a watch over my mouth, Jesus. I'm working on that. I'm working on it. Sorry, sorry. Let me remind Simmering that. hot tea. Uh, <laughs> after he stormed up, I honestly thought he was kidding. I, I was really just kind of waiting for a minute, like waiting for the da -da -da -da, because it was there was nothing that was said that I felt like was personal. We were talking about a hypothetical situation about a show that hasn't casted me, that I haven't turned down, that I haven't and asked like, to be on. If you would give them game was right. somehow what you started arguing about. And you were basically like, I'm not going to just right. give, give random people game for free. And he's like, no, you should. And I'm watching it just kind of thinking like, that's what this argument is about. Were you, like, so what you were confused as me. It just seemed like a weird thing to argue about. It, 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 like, I does he have private stake in Zeus? Like, is he a stockholder? Well, I mean, oh, so that like, was a, that was about like, a Zeus show, like, hypothetically. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, we're we're just talking about you know reality TV and things like that, and and I was thinking the conversation was going really well, and then you know he brought it what I do baddies, and I said no. And he made a comment, something like, oh, you think you're better than them? No, I don't think I'm better than them. I know I'm better than them. Hmm. And that's not even like, that's not a dig or nor is it shade. Like I was at a place in my life where certain things like that were appealing to me. And that doesn't mean that, that I was wrong for that. That just means that's where I was in life. Mm -hmm. And people grow and people evolve and people change. And now a reality TV is, even when I was doing Love and Hip Hop and growing up hip hop, and to me, that was super ratchet. It's gotten worse now. They've digressed to where when I was on the show, like, you weren't supposed to fight. Like, they had 
four big security guards, you know, per person. And, you know, because like there was a scene that's been deleted that never aired <laughs> where I walked up to a girl and didn't say a word to her and I punched her in the face. Wow. And what was that over? So super long time ago, there was an episode where um, I was the face of this club called Ace of Diamonds in, in Hollywood. Uh-huh. And one of the cast members, Nikki, her parents owned the club and I was hired to do the, the photo shoot and the billboard, and all that stuff. Um, so I had billboards all over in real life on Sunset Boulevard, at, um, in Las Vegas, all over. Uh-huh. And they tried to make an episode where they pretended like they took me off the billboard mm. and put my mug shot from when I got arrested at 19 years old up. Mm-hmm. Now that didn't really happen, but they rented a billboard outside of the boom, boom room, not too far from here where everybody records to put this mug shot up of this fake billboard to make it look like they replaced the billboard. Right. And, you know, again, I wasn't exactly sure what I was walking myself into what the scene was, but they wanted me to walk up to this billboard and meet Nikki there and pretend like she she had the power to get my billboards taken off Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Right. You know, so of course they told me what was happening once I pulled up. And they're like, what are you going to do? And I tell them, Mona, I'm probably going to punch her in the face. And she's like, Masika, don't, don't, no, I said, I'm probably going to punch her in the eye. And, and, and I hate to even talk about this, but me and Nikki are cool now. Like, like she just had a, a, a beautiful son, I, I sent her nothing but well wishes, but it, you know, it's history. It's like you were both pro wrestlers. Yes. That's just like part of what right. you do when you're a pro wrestler. It doesn't mean you hate the right. person forever. It's right. just, you're caught up in the moment. Right. Um, so I, you know, the scene comes, she's coming from this and I'm coming from this and I walk up to her and I was just so livid that they tried this. I just, I didn't say anything. I just punched her in the nose. Uh-huh. And I remember Mona said, you said you weren't going to punch her. I said, I, I said, we're going to punch her in the eye. Uh-huh. <laughs> so like they, they had to delete the scene because there was no dialogue. You know, Mona was so furious and she was like, you guys didn't even have a conversation. Like, at least at least talk about it, because now it's crazy. You just walked up to the girl and punched the girl right. for no reason. Like, I have to get rid of this scene. I have to make it go away. And, you know, she was like, we're going to dead the billboard. We're going to we shouldn't have did it. Da, da, da. But then some of the other hating ass castmates found out about the scene afterwards, came up, took pictures of it and and posted it. So now the shade room posted it. Now, people actually thought that there was really this billboard. It was a prop for for an episode. Mm. But back then, you couldn't just walk up and hit somebody. You had to do a scene. You had to, do, you know what I'm saying? They tried to they tried to get a conversation at least. Yes, they wanted the drama and they wanted the beef, but and if they wanted more of an educated ignorance. Right. I feel like where we've gone today, I hate to say we've evolved because we're digressing. Now it's just you walk in and people start fighting. What happened? I haven't really watched any of this, to be honest. You're missing nothing. Do you, do you keep up on it? No. I only see it because it's on my timeline on Instagram. Right. Like, you can't open your phone without seeing it. I'll see some shit if it goes viral sometimes. And yeah. The, and the, to be honest, the Krishan and Blueface thing has kind of, like, brought me closer to, like, knowing about what's going on on yeah. Zeus, even though I have not actually... I, I want to sign up and actually watch this shit because I hear so much about it, and I listen to some of the clips of academics interviewing the CEO of Zeus, and it was pretty fucking funny to hear him media trained as fuck, just trying to like kind of explain. It's the WWE, <laughs> yeah. you know. Of course, of course, you don't want to get sued, which, 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 he's getting sued by plenty of people. He is rightfully so. Apparently, he's like unbelievably rich, so that's probably inevitable. Yeah. So you know, when you know, you you learn how to tell beautiful lies. Right. Ax said he had like fifteen security guards with him. Well, that seems a little excessive to me. It is. I you know, know. I mean, it's kind of like the. Uh, what what is his name? The the Lord. The president. No, the the rapper with the c- color hair. Jeez. Oh, six nine. Kind of like how he used to, to do. That was funny when he was on Melrose with like the most insane security yeah. squad ever. That was so funny. Well, you know when you know that you're intentionally ruining people's lives, right? And you know that you're setting people up for failure so that you can make money off of them. You gotta kind of be scared. I'm not. I can't like really fully pass judgment because I am only familiar with like the things that go viral outside of the content on there. So that's what I'm judging based on. But yeah. it, it feels like the Zeus network is like love and hip hop with no adults in the room because it's like if you <laughs> yeah. just if you just have a streaming service, 
there's nobody to tell yeah. you not yeah. to do these things. Whereas yeah. if you're VH1 or BET or whatever, they have to follow certain guidelines. Yeah, and they're big corporations, and ultimately, like they have to answer to stockholders and all this kind of shit. So I can right. imagine there's like r things in place to basically make them not do the most extreme exactly. things possible. Even us, we're on YouTube, but if you have your own fucking streaming platform like that, you can really probably exactly. just do whatever. Even right? YouTube, like you said, you, you, there's certain things you can and can't say, can and can't do. You yeah. know. They'll take you down. Right. You know, but yeah, with, with streaming platforms like that, like they'll set you up, you know, unbeknownst to you to have a fight right. and things like that. So, you know, when he was just suggesting that I should be Mother Teresa <laughs> and go frolic like it's where at Woodstock, you know, barefoot and hold hands with, with girls on, on the show. It was just ridiculous to me. Uh -huh. um, you know, I'm not here for that. I, I've, I've passed that. And then, you know, his point was, well, you did it before. Okay, um, I used to use baby powder, and then I found out it gave people cancer, so I stopped. Uh huh. Uh, you know, like there's a lot of things that you may have done at one point in your life that you don't do anymore, and and, and to use the fact that you did it before is crazy. And even the fact that I have done reality TV again, it was not like this. So I was just very confused as to what set him off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remained calm, stayed poised, kept my composure. And he was just, in, I don't know if his, his drink had something in it or if the weed was laced, but whatever it was, like, I was so like, what just happened here? <laughs> like, yeah, it was like, are, like, are you in a, in a private relationship with someone on the show? Like, <laughs> he seemed a little frustrated with you throughout it, though. Yeah, I, I didn't get that. I didn't, well, no, I got that energy, but I didn't know where that came from. Right. Um, but a lot of times with men that are narcissists, when they're talking to a level minded woman, who is not acting a, a fool, they don't know what to do. Yeah. And a lot of times when a man feels like he's challenged, whether it's a challenge or not, if his ego sets in and they can't, they can't tame you, they run off. It was kind of, cause like early on, on No Jumper, when Sharp first came here, that was kind of like his thing. Like he would just end up getting in these huge arguments with girls and like <laughs> they would walk out or like, you know, crazy shit. Like, yeah. And it would just go viral all the time. And it, it, it's, it's kind of hasn't happened in a while. Yeah. But it, so that was why that was kind of like a throwback of like, oh, oh okay. Yeah. We, I, haven't, I haven't seen this thing in a while. Yeah. yeah. It was just, it was, it was weird. It was weird. I've never been on a situation where someone walked off their own show. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty rare. But you know, hey. I think he might have done it before, though. Maybe. I just right. haven't seen it. Okay. But so, <laughs> wait, all right. Just to, to rewind a little bit. You're from Atlanta, or where are you from? I'm from heaven, um, as I mentioned. Heaven, right, yep. right, right. I forgot. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> born and raised in Chicago. Right. And, right, right, yeah. right, right, right. So you're a GD or a BD? So I'm neither. I'm no. neither, but my, I have a lot of, I ha well, let me not snitch on nobody. I um have a lot of people oh, around me. You've been associated? You've been yeah. O-Block? Yeah. Really? It's not even that big of a deal. Like, I mean, depending on what day you go, I guess. I mean, on. here's the thing. Like, I mean, I, I grew up in Chicago. So, you know, hearing people talk about O Block right. and 63rd and all this stuff is like, I used to walk past that street. Like, mm. you know, we, like when you grow up there, it's, yeah, okay, it's a thing. But like, I, I remember as a kid when we would drive from, you know, one side of my dad's side of town to my mom's side of town, my dad would tell us, take off your seatbelts, get on the floor. And he would be driving down like this because like people that there's GD on one side or folks on the other side or Latin Kings. And well, I don't remember what it was, right. but like they're just shooting across the highway mm -hmm. at each other, you know? So like, unfortunately these things were so normal. I remember seeing my first dead body in an alley when I was nine years old Really? and I came home and wrote a song about it. Song? <laughs> were you writing a lot of songs at the time or did this just bring it out? Of you? I think that was the first song I remember writing. Wow. Yeah. And like I had no emotion behind it because that's just you know it was so normal it wasn't until i moved away and was like oh that wasn't normal right oh that might have traumatized me a little bit maybe yeah. <laughs> you know but again i didn't think of it at like like that you know i just it was just like oh yeah someone's getting shot let's, let's go open the fire hydrant and play in the water <laughs> right yeah, it was just a thing. And it's just crazy to come from there to now. I'm, I'm the bougiest bitch I know. Really? So. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So you, did you have like a pretty good home life though? I really did. Of it? Yeah. I really did. Like, you know, my I have very young parents. They got married at 18 and 21. And um, I didn't know that I was missing anything. I didn't know we were poor. Uh -huh. I didn't know that, you know, like 
I had everything I, I, I wanted. And then the things that I didn't have, I didn't know about them. Mm. You know, so like we didn't ha- never had the New Jordans until I started working and had my own, my own job as a teenager. But I didn't even know that there were New Jordans. I had clean shoes from Payless. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I played with my friends. I played with my cousins. We were outside every day. I, you know, I had Barbies to play with. I had clean clothes. Food. I didn't know that there was a luxury life that I <laughs> didn't know about. Right. You know, I think that's what's different now is that every kid, as soon as they get TikTok or Instagram can just tell like, oh, this is how the Kardashians live. Yeah. And I don't have that. So yeah. therefore I'm kind of poor or, or yeah. you know, <laughs> definitely poor compared to them. Yeah. And so then people like spend their whole life kind of obsessed with this ideal, which I didn't know about when I was a kid either. I didn't know what the fuck. I, I didn't know a single luxury or designer brand yes. all through high school. Yes. I also didn't know any anything about drugs which is really good that I, I couldn't have told you anything about like cocaine adderall xanax i didn't know anything about all that which i, I consider myself very lucky that yeah. i somehow didn't know about all that yeah and i didn't really know about gangs either which is good it's not like there were so gangs that, around so that's but a, i grew up with the gang i could have commuted yeah. and maybe joined a gang but yeah <laughs> i avoided that so and you know one thing i want to say like what you're saying about not knowing the luxury and stuff my kids go to my kid goes to school with the kardashians mm like the what people would think is the complete opposite the most humble down to earth sweetest people you know so i just it's you know it's not like oh they have this and i don't have that they don't give that at all but like i could see why you would think that like you know it would seem like oh this kid has this and i don't have that the school they go to they it's really good about about that no one like the the kids act like kids mm-hmm. i don't really see it. of course my daughter she's in second grade so i don't know what happens and the older upper class right. stuff like that but yeah there was a time you know where when i when i moved to atlanta and went to school in a different area where there was like oh you have gucci shoes i have payless shoes you know but i at elementary i didn't really experience that but yeah that that definitely can make a kid feel a certain way designer to me was like abercrombie see i i, I couldn't <laughs> even pronounce abercrombie really? <laughs> I, I remember all I know about Abercrombie as a kid is that the store, when you walk by the store, it was a really strong smell. Yeah. That's all I knew. I, I We didn't even go in that store. And then I moved to uh, uh, to New York and I would walk by Abercrombie and there would be like a chick in like, you know, jean shorts and like a bikini top and a dude in jeans with his shirt off. And he was like super buff. In the window? And th- they would just be standing there. Like that was the people that greeted you when you walked into the store. And I was just like, what the I fuck? I wonder what they got paid to do. I know. Imagine being that dude just standing there with your shirt off all day, just flexing. Yeah. So I just stand outside of Abercrombie and get paid. I know. He's probably hyped too. Those <laughs> Abercrombie stores would smell like the Abercrombie uh, fragrances yeah. so bad. So it would but like it burn my pretty eyes. Good, though. I walk by. I, I thought it smelled pretty good. I've never been like a cologne guy, but I always thought like they smelled pretty good. See, I'm a cologne girl now. I just like have never even thought about it. Yeah. I have a cologne in my house. I just never even think to put it on. Do you have a favorite one, or you just you just not that guy? I have Versace cologne in my house that I wear maybe like two times a year when I notice it staring back at me on the on, okay. the, on the counter. Okay, so note to self: for Christmas stocking stuffers, no cologne. I stink. No, no, um, no cologne. Well, you're thinking of giving me a Christmas gift. That's good to know. No, no, I didn't say for me. I was letting people know. I need more relationships <laughs> like that that come with Christmas gifts. You know what? I'm terrible at gift giving. I actually don't want that responsibility. I love gift giving, but the problem is I always forget until it's too late. Yeah. And that makes me feel like the biggest piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I decided something today. I'm going to start doing um, just getting like gifts like for for my my daughter, for mm. like her classmates. So it's ready. Bo- boy gifts, girl gifts. Because every time there's a birthday party I'm, in the morning, I'm like, ah, I got to get a gift. Got to get a gift. Mm. I'm just going to have like Valentine's Day cards on deck, birthday cards on deck. Just, you know, I, I, I got I have to be that mom. I got I have because there's no way. There's, I love my girl's birthday in June because then there's, she's a Gemini. there's nothing else until Christmas. So I don't have to think about it. It's just like you have that nice June what? Gulf first. I'm June 7th. Really? She must be really cool. Yeah. You guys are. Gemini women are the best. Wait, how old are you? How old am I? It just depends on I'm not supposed what to day. ask that, right? Yeah. I haven't decided how I'm going to turn yet. Okay. I'm thinking 29. <laughs> Is that fuck? Now I'm gonna should I Google it? I mean, Google should has the Google has me from thirty to probably seventy five. I don't know. Seventy five seems outlandish. Yeah, yeah. I'm mid thirties. Okay, we'll just say that. Is that I'm thirty nine? I'm like right around the corner from forty. That's a cool age. It's scary. It's because cool, it's like forty. Like it's I'm like sorry. you're still in your thirties, but it's like wait a minute. It's like something has to change in my life. Yeah, 40. my brother, my my brother, he'll be forty in November. Really? Yeah, and like to me, we're still kids. I'm like, 
How did when did that happen? And you've seen has he has he had to like grow up? Because like I'm I'm certain that if I was still living the same life at forty that I was living when I was thirty two, that that would seem like a failure to me. It's just it so it changes so so much happens so quickly. Yeah. And it's like you know you still feel like okay wait a minute low key I still feel like I'm a kid but wait I'm almost forty. Right. It's crazy. Yeah, but then like think about people you know who are fifty. Like I think Joe Rogan's like fifty five. Well, you know. I mean, we'll get there. And Joe's like someone I've been paying attention to for forever. Yeah. But he definitely seems distinctly old in my head, like in a way that I don't feel old. And yeah. most of the people I hang out with don't feel old. And when I think about all the dudes I know who are like 55, that's like the old homie. <laughs> like, but, you know, when, you, when you, you, know? you think about it right now, like at 25, 40 just seemed so old. Now it's like, wait a minute, that's not old. But the other day I was... Uh, had to do something with this woman and I was thinking in my head like she's old like she's like older and then I, I realized <laughs> I'm close to her age. she's quite a few years younger than me and oh. like and then I'm just like oh dude like that's fucked up like you 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 can't just be thinking of this person as like an older woman when yeah. she's younger than you yeah you have to and recalibrate it's, it's, your it's brain crazy a bit. how we naturally think of women over 30 as like oh she's old mm. you know I'll get girls that be like Girl, you too old to do that. You too old to do that. Do, 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 do. Meanwhile, baby, you 28. Right. I'm a handful older than you. Like, do you want to die when you turn 30? Right. Like, do you think that that's the end of life? And it's just the comments are, are, are so, are, she's too old to, to breathe. She's too old to wear that. She's too old to say that. Right. Well, what is the age where you stop being yourself? What what age do you turn where you no longer get to have an opinion? Right. And, and what I think a lot of people miss is that to make it far into life is the goal. Yeah. That's your reward exactly. is that you're like, like I try to, I'm constantly thinking about the fact of like how lucky I feel to still be in a position where oh, I yeah. get to do stuff I'm excited about and my job is fun and I haven't had to like retire away to this like boring ass exactly. existence. Like even just to be able to keep that going because realistically with the hip hop side of things, I didn't really like, get going until I was like 32, 33. So I already felt old by the time I actually like kind of got a, a shot in hip hop, right. you know? Right. So to even like, right. I still kind of feel young in that sense of like, well, y'all have not known me that long. Exactly. So I still feel young. Exactly. Yeah. But very true. Like, you know, it, I think it's a, it's a blessing at 30, 35, being able to still have, you know, a, a foot in the game right. here. You know, there was never a point where I had to go sit behind a desk and, and, do some paperwork I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, God has afforded me that opportunity to, and to still be relevant to where these younger girls are running their mouth about me. Because if you weren't still talking about me, I wouldn't be relevant, honey. Mm -hmm. You telling me that what I should do makes more people care about what I'm doing. Right. <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, like it is what it is. I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful that someone still cares. <laughs> so okay, you moved to Atlanta to go to college, and no, my parents moved to Atlanta oh, okay. when I was still in high school. Okay, um, so I graduated high school there, and, and then, what was that culture shock like? You went to public school? Yeah, so I went from I, I was in private school up until eleventh uh, grade. Okay, so I was in private school from kindergarten to tenth grade. Oh, okay, and then when I went to public school the last two years, I thought it was awesome, but I was like, these kids are stupid. <laughs> Just that was your main observation. That it was kind of you dumb. Know, they, I remember I was in AP English in eleventh grade, and they were teaching something uh, that I learned in fourth grade. Really? And I was like, I, mean, I guess I'm not really surprised. Public I was learning like, about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and like the Dewey Decimal System, things that I learned in elementary school. Right. And I'm like, okay, this is this is different, but it was cool because. It, that's when I, you know, kind of first started getting around, you know, kids that were rapping at the lunch table and like uh, super creatives and, and stuff like that, where I felt like before then, you know, we were kind of put in to like more tamed, like we couldn't really express ourselves that way. Mm. You know, that was the first time I, I got to lunch and like, oh, we're, we're rapping, we're singing, we're this, we're that, I, you know, we're, we have, we're, doing, we're dancing. So it was a good experience. I'm glad that I had both, though. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I used, when I was in private school and I got to high school, I would beg my parents to take me out of it. Like, I want to go to public school. I want to go to public school. I want to be with my friends. And when I got to public school, I was like, okay, I get why they didn't. They didn't mm -hmm. put me in sooner. But I'm glad that I got to see both worlds. Yeah. Right. And so you were on track to go to college? 
Yeah. Um, so I was I ran track. I did volleyball. I played basketball. I sucked. But I played basketball to keep in shape. Um, I was uh, doing ballet. Um, I was. A, That's a lot. Yeah, a lot I was doing a lot of activities. Yeah, I had a 4.0 up until my senior year because um, my dad thought it would be a great idea to make us stop playing sports to get a job. A job. Mm-hmm. Which was crazy because I, I could have gotten a track scholarship easily. Really? Um, but. Why did he do that? He was just hurting for money? No, you know, I just think it's kind of like how, how he was raised. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you're a product of your environment. And, um, you know, I know, I don't think it was anything malicious. I think, you know, I was raised where, you know, you, you go to college and you this and you that, and you have to be practical. You have to be practical. And um, I think for, you know, my dad, it was like, okay, playing sports is cool, but but, but they need careers. And, you know, I think it was m- more of him just trying to, you know, do what he thought was best as, as being practical. Right. Um, and I get it. I get it. You know, I, I wouldn't do that now that I have my own children, mm. but I'm not going to fault him for doing what he thought was, was right. Right. Um, you know, my father had a full ride scholarship to Morehouse and decided, you know, when he married my mother, that he, you know, he thought it'd be a better idea to join the Air Force to make sure that, you know, he had insurance and could provide. And, you know, I see that thinking too, but now I'm like, well, you could have, you could have been drafted, dad. You, <laughs> you were playing football. Like, yeah. could have had a whole different life. But. Damn, that sucks. Because it's like, you know, <laughs> you doing those sports or you doing like extracurricular activities when that you're that young is so valuable yeah. in comparison to like, you know, working at fucking Michael's or whatever. Yeah, you yeah I was doing. working at a, sh- a shoe store mm. called Jets for Feet, and that was the first time that I had the new Jordans really? in my life. Yeah. You became yeah. a sneakerhead, so oh, it was all man. worth it. Um, oh, man. I mean, you know, yes or no, but, like, that was the first time, like, I had the matching Carolina blue sneakers to go with the Carolina blue shirt and the, mm. you know, like, I, before then, it was, like I said, I didn't have any of that. So um, then I decided that as soon as I graduate, I'm going back to Chicago. Mm-hmm. And um, I visited L.A. for the first time. And said, oh, this is where it's going to be. I got to move here. I remember being at a college party in Laguna Beach. I looked out one side. I saw the ocean. I looked out another side. I saw the mountains. I looked out another side. I saw the skyline. Mm-hmm. And I was surrounded by black kids pulling up in Rolls Royces and Bentleys <laughs> and, you know, all these cars. And, like, they were dripped in jewelry. And, you know, I'm like, these are rich black kids. At that point, that was my first time seeing that. Really? I didn't know that. Black people could have money. I didn't know about, you know, the, the, the most affluent black family I had ever seen was the Huxtables mm. or, you know, Family Matters or something like that. So this was my first time at, at 17, 18 years old seeing, oh, wow. And I don't know if it was so much that it was L.A. that did that or that it's because it was L.A. that I saw that, that I just decided then and there, oh, I'm moving to L.A., I'm moving to L.A. Mm. Now, as I traveled back and forth, you know, visiting friends and just things like that, then I'm like, okay, the opportunities out here, you know, at that point now there's more, you know, s- studios and sound stages and other places. But at that point, like if you wanted to be an actress or anything, you had to go to L.A. And you already wanted to do entertainment? Or- yeah, yeah. So, um when I, but you hadn't like modeled or anything? You were just yeah, thinking about it? Yeah, no, I had. But like, I mean, I used to do like King Magazine oh, and like uh-huh. Black Men's Magazine and Ooh. a lot of music videos and stuff like that. So I was considered a video vixen in Atlanta. So you're already known as that. Okay. Yeah. But like my first actual job was um, a small role in a movie called Three Can Play That Game with Vivica Fox and a lot of other, you know, a lot of other um, actors. And I went from that then started kind of doing music videos and stuff like that. So I had kind of already been in it, but I just, you know, there there was no big agents in Atlanta. Mm. There was no, like, you know, all the auditions and the jobs I wanted was in L.A. Right. So I was like, okay, I just got to, I got to save my money and move. And that's just... Enter the roommate situation? Yeah. But so then, all right, how long were you in L.A. before the Love and Hip Hop thing happened? Not long at all. So I moved to L.A., um, in September of 2011, I want to say, uh-huh. I think it was 2011, August or September, 2011. And, um, I was, you know, going to auditions and just every audition that I could get, whether it was a TV show, a music video, a commercial, you know, I was just everything I saw. And I remember, uh, was it, it was in January of the next year. So maybe not even a full five months later. Um, I woke up and two of my best friends sent me 
a write up that was on Boss Up saying Love and Hip Hop is coming to Hollywood. Right. And they were one one lived in Miami, one lived here, and they were like my older girlfriends were like, "Girl, you got to do this show. You got to do this show." And my immediate thought was, "I ain't doing that show. I would never do that show." And then, not even a split second later, I said, "Would I rather be a working actor or act like I'm working?" Mm-hmm. And I said, "I'm going to get on that show." Right. And I kind of you know told Sharp kind of how that came to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, not to be redundant, <laughs> um, but yeah. So for me, it was this is a solid job. Right. And I thought that it was a solid job that would propel my music career that, uh-huh. and, that, and, and, and even my acting career. Um, during that time, a lot of producers and directors didn't want to take a chance on reality stars as far as serious acting roles. That has completely changed to where now they're booking more reality stars for serious acting roles. Right. So, you know. It's crazy because, all right, so I watched the Breakfast Club interview that you did like seven or eight years ago. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm somebody who has previously said, like, oh, you know, I miss the old Charlemagne or like, you know, he used to be all edgy and offensive and that was sick. And I watched that episode and I was just like, okay, I'm really glad that he left this fucking persona behind because it was like and it not even to put it on him because Envy was doing the same fucking thing. Envy tried me. And I'm not even gonna act all high and mighty because I've definitely done episodes where I was disrespectful to the person I was interviewing and I'm obviously like viewing this through the lens of having respect for you so like to me it just came off crazy they're like making everything about sex every dude you mention they're just like oh you fucked him like and it was just very like hard to listen to it was like, gross it, it was, was gross. actually fucking weird and I actually like so now when I think about because I watched a Vlad actually did coincidentally a flashback clip today of Charlemagne kind of talking about the fact that as their show grew he had to kind of leave this like you know uh, over the top shock jock persona behind but holy shit does your interview with them exemplify that that's enough of me white knighting do you agree no definitely um black can go fuck himself by the way but we'll talk about that later oh really uh, yeah, I'll get to that later okay. uh, so, but sorry, anyway uh, <laughs> so and, and I said that um, you know I, I feel like Sharp probably should have watched that interview to mm. realize that there's nothing you can say to me that's going to take me off my square. At the, at the end of the day, at that time, my objective was to go on Hot 97 and get my song played. Mm-hmm. That was my objective, to get the radio spins. So I already knew that they were going to be coming at me crazy. And, you know, like like when uh, Birdman was on air and, and, you know, walked <laughs> off the set and told him, what, what did he say? The tree, this, what? I don't remember what he said, but. He said, uh. It was, it was it was viral. I just watched DJ Envy talking about it. Well, we that that moment. Put some respect on my name. Yeah, put some respect on my name. Yeah. Like, you know, that that part like for me it's like okay. Your your objective is to try and see me act like the person that you hope that I am or you think that I am or that I've been portrayed to be. Mm. My objective is to play my song on Hot 97. Right. So, I'm not going to allow you to to shake me. And the, the crazy part is, like, if 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 your persona, your image is a sexual image or, you know, I, I saw the, the porn podcast thing up there. Uh, like, if that if that's what you're into, then great. Right. That's what you talk about. But where in society did we become so normalized with just talking to random people that we've never had sex with about sex? Right. Why does it matter who I've got in bed when I'm sitting at a table? With like, you? the tone of that podcast would be kind of normal if you're a porn star. Right. But it was like right. just the fact that you so clearly didn't really want that to be the tone of the conversation and made it like super hard to listen to. And, yeah. and, and that's just like pre me to pre, you know, woke era where everybody kind of thinks about, you know, women and what they want right. and, and a, lot, a lot more detail. And it's like, I don't know, it just really like that's a remnant. Of, of that era that would be hard to imagine yeah. these days, honestly. You know, it, it's so common to disrespect women, especially black women. Mm. And and coming from black men, it's like, how dare you? And then watching Angelina just kind of sit there. And she tried I, you to know, fight back at a little bit, but she was kind of powerless. Yeah, I too. mean, I, I get her position too, but yeah. like, you know, it's only so long that you can jump in the cage with, with buffoons. You know what I'm mm. saying? And, and I don't know if that's the reason why she branched off and, and decided to do her own thing or not, you mm. know, but good for her. Um, you know, DJ Envy, it's just, it's, 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 it's comical to me when I come somewhere that I've been invited to go on Mm -hmm. and clearly, you know, 
as you know, you have to, even if you don't know who's coming, you have to do your research so that you know what to discuss, what to talk about. Even if you've never seen me before in your life, when I come in that chair, you know who I am. Even you, like, uh, uh, you know how mortified I would be if I accidentally like said that you had a baby with somebody that you didn't have a baby with? Because that's how it starts. Is they're just like, oh, you have a baby with young Berg. You're like, no, I don't. <laughs> it's just like, right. I, I would be hella embarrassed if I did that, but they clearly like but really see, didn't like give they, a fuck. But like see, yeah. like they, they know that's not the case. Right. So they're hoping that that happens for the big aha moment. Mm. And it's like, I already know that you're trying to do that. So I'm not going to give it to you because, again, you're about to play my song. And Shout out Young Berg. Huh? Nothing wrong with having a baby with Young Berg. I mean, hey, I don't have one, so I couldn't tell you. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> like, to all the women who do. I don't think he has any kids. No? Wow. I don't think so. But, you know, I'm also not keeping up. So. One, one day. Hey, you know, it's a great thing. I was supposed to interview Young Berg a long time ago. Uh, I should hit him up. Sure. Well, because he has a producer name now, too. I forget. He's like a big producer at this point. Yeah. Put some respect on Young Berg's name. You can. So you don't like them? Oh shit! Okay, I just realized I, I walked. In, I walked in on somebody. I have nothing to oh, say. All right, all right. My bad. My bad. I, I didn't mean to, to do say. anything here. No, all no, right. you did it. You, 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 you did it. I just, you know, yeah. Was that that Breakfast Club era though? Was, did, was that the vibe in a lot of situations as a as a woman coming up around that time? Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, again, I feel like disrespect was what people. Um, got attention for and again you know coming from a show like love and hip-hop they're hoping that i'm gonna act a fool mm. and you know that's just not the case um I'm, I'm very well versed i'm very well spoken i'm very educated you know and and when i whatever it is that i'm trying to do i'm gonna get that done mm -hmm. you know so i'm going i i think i'm one of the best interviewers i can address what i want to address dance around a question and do a backflip on it and and still come out on top you're you know? a politician pretty much you know without ha without even being media trained i'm just I'm, just, I'm i know i know what i need to get done i know how it needs to happen and nine times out of ten i know how it's going to be portrayed that's one of my favorite things in the debates and stuff is when they ask them like a question and then they just don't answer the question they just start talking about something, something completely else. different like <laughs> that is an amazing skill yeah and a lot of times i find myself on podcasts and i answer questions too literally where I'm like actually answering the exact question that they asked me. And it kind of like, which is great. It's, it's, it's just because <laughs> that's kind of how my brain works. But then meanwhile, like I could have took that question in any kind of, you know, you, you have to kind of go into any interview or any conversation thinking about like what you want to exactly. put out there. Exactly. Have some objectives in mind. E exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So at that, that time my, my objective happened. And you know, the funny thing is like, I feel like people don't want to like me and then they accidentally like me. And, you know, when I played this, the record I had at the time, it was my single called Undelay featuring Fetty Wap, obviously. Mm -hmm. And it's just so, it feels so weird calling them that. And, um, <laughs> you know, at, at that time, what, it was like 2015, 2016, I want to say. And, you know, that was his big year. He did his big one. You know, he was every, you couldn't turn on the radio without mm -hmm. hearing him. He was obviously one of the hottest artists of the year. So when we played the record, they wanted to hate it so bad. And I just remember the look on their faces like, I mean, it's not, we don't hate it. It's not bad. And the funniest thing is like, you're both huge fans of, of Fetty Wap. Huge. Mm -hmm. Especially you, DJ Penny, which is what I was calling him because he pretended like he couldn't pronounce my name. You mm -hmm. know my name. You've, you've said it 10 times. You probably said it in your sleep. You know my name. So, you know, and, and he like, I knew how much of a fan he was mm -hmm. of him at the time. So when I played the record, the song starts with Fetty Wap. It doesn't start with me. So before I even came on, they were like, I mean, it's decent. I mean, I said, that's how I know you're a hater. You didn't even listen because you haven't even heard me say a word yet. Mm. You just want to dislike it because it's mine. And then like, they were like, uh, okay. Oh, okay. Keep playing. Keep playing. You actually didn't even realize that you accidentally insulted somebody that you're a fan of because it's affiliated with me. Mm -hmm. By the end of the interview, I don't know if you, you watched it to the end when I got up, uh, Charlemagne sniffed my chair like a weirdo. Oh, I, did, I, I didn't watch <laughs> like, like the last 10 or 15 we, minutes, but... It was like, I love you. I love you. Because nothing he used you to did do that. me. He used to do that a bit, I it think. It was weird. And, and that was... I it was he weird. He stopped doing it at a certain point, yeah. It like, was weird. I'm all about offensive jokes, but definitely I feel like when the girl isn't putting her out there to be like in to an be, explicitly yeah. sexual role, that, exactly. that kind of stuff comes off weird. Exactly. You know? it, 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 it does come off weird. And then, you know, we all have jobs to do. But right. for two married men to be talking to someone like that is just 
weird. It's just weird. Mm. Even married or not, but that part is it's just it's just weird. But you kind of get hit with the double whammy too because you're the uh, like our culture has a lot of assumptions about of the, about the rapper baby mama. Oh yeah. So you kind of like have to deal with that as well. There's yeah. Like the love and hip hop uh, assumptions people might have about you. And then the, that, that whole thing too. So I heard you like tell the story about how you met Fetty Wap and everything. And, and you guys ended up, cause you weren't really like ever with him for like an extended period of time. No, we were. For how, <laughs> how long? I mean, on and off for some years. Okay. <laughs> on and off for some it years. It sounded like it was kind of rocky from the beginning though. Right? Um, no, it was, a, it was a blast from the beginning. Oh, okay. Um, uh, hmm, let me see. I, I like to be careful about yeah, yeah. what I say because we we have a daughter who is at the age now where she'll come home like, Mom, someone told me such and such. How old is she? She's seven. Okay. And, you know, so even though she's not, like, on Instagram like that, like, you know, she'll go on YouTube and she can see TikTok and things like that on on YouTube. And Shout like, out to all the clippers. Everybody <laughs> who's going to take this and put it on TikTok. Oh, yeah. And, and oh, you know us. it will be. Yeah. And, and make money <laughs> off of us. That <laughs> aggravates me. But, like, you know, she'll go on YouTube and, like, Mom, I want to watch my birthday video. Or, Mom, I want to watch this. And she'll type in her name and all this stuff will pop up. And, mm. I, you know, so I have to be very careful. I don't ever want to say something that can change how she sees her mother or her father. Right. Because it came out of my mouth. Respect. Um. So no, when we, we first met, we had a blast. We had a we had a, a, a great time. Well, when two like like we were at the peak of our, our entertainment careers at that time. You know, like he was the top guy. I was on the number one reality show, one of the number one characters on the show. You know, I was booked and busy everywhere. He was booked and busy everywhere. Like our relationship was like a tour, you know? So we had a blast. Were you like touring together most of the time or were you kind of booked separately a lot? So, you so had we to were apart? booked separately um, already. Like we we met in the in the middle of him touring. Or right. not, I don't know if it was an actual tour, but, you know, he had a Especially bunch of Especially in the middle of a moment like the one he was having. It, it was crazy. On the road it was, constantly. It was insane. You got to get it the was, money while exactly. you can, right? It was insane. But, you know, like we did what we could like together. Like I'm filming this day. You're here this day. But, you know, we would. I would go with him more so right. on his stuff, okay. his, his his shows, his you know performances, or you know we went skydiving. He did he did this young and reckless thing, and you know so I would more so accommodate his schedule at the time because I was filming stationary for the most part. Mm. Um, you know we had we had a great time. Things kind of went left. Um, well, again, I got to be careful what I say, like. Let, let's just say he wanted to have a baby and I didn't, and he didn't like that. Okay. Um, and that's kind of what started like our little bickering back and forth. Mm. Um, but, but then you did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you weren't really hyped on how it went down. Um, you know, I mean, who would be? Yeah. I don't, I don't think anybody that's young and unmarried wants to have a tumultuous situation, whether it's one day or one week. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the thing is, we had our little beef. We had our little bickering back and forth childishness. But that was just a small moment. You know what I'm saying? That, w that wasn't the duration. That wasn't, that didn't categorize our actual relationship at all. But because, again, people remember the biggest negative. I still hear about it today. You were like... 23, maybe 24, 25. No, I was 28. Like 28. Okay. I was 28. He was 24. Okay. And w so you end up having the baby. Was there any thought of not having the baby once you got pregnant? No, 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 no. not an option for you personally. No, no. I, I remember the moment I found out I was pregnant. I froze. And then when I came to, <laughs> I think I passed out a little bit. I think my, my first thought was, okay, I'm just gonna have to make some changes. Like I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to make some changes. And it was never a moment where it was like there was another option. Were you partying at that point in your life? Was I partying? <laughs> I mean, you're on tour with a rapper, yeah, I guess. So, sense, I mean, right? I'm not going to say I was on tour, you know what I mean? Right, but right, like, you're, you're, okay, so the day before I found out I was pregnant, I was in the studio at Party Next Door. That's the biggest thing that you got to change once you get pregnant, right? Oh, yeah. Like, really assess Just, everything that's yeah. going into your body. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Unless you're Christian on rock. Yeah. God, oh, <laughs> Lord, Lord. Fix it, Jesus. Lord. Pray for that baby's come, we hernia. Come, we come before you today, Jesus. Pray for the hernia. Okay. 
Oh my God. I can't even. <laughs> well, well, maybe later. I can't. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, but <laughs> whew, the day before I found out I was pregnant, I was in the studio party next door and we were drinking gin and I had never had gin before. And I'm like, this is an old man's drink. And I, I got so sick, so, so, so sick. And I was like throwing up like crazy. And um, I'm like, that that gin messed me up. It really, it really messed me up. And the next day I was getting back in the studio with him. And um, I had a consultation to get a, a breast augmentation. And then I had a hair appointment. Mm-hmm. So I went to my, my, no, not a consultation. It was my pre-op. It was like a Friday and I was having, I was having my surgery on a Monday. Mm-hmm. So I had to go get all my lab work and stuff that, like that, that done that Friday just to make sure, you know, they, before you get a boob job, yeah, you have to before make you have sure you're any okay. Type of surgery, they're supposed to check all of your vitals, your levels, your iron, your blood, like, right. I didn't know if, that. That makes sense. Any board certified surgeon or anybody that's operating on you that they have, they have to do that. Got it. If they don't, throw them away. Like, cause any, any, anything can happen. If your iron levels are off, they can't operate on you. Like, okay. unless they're unethical, obviously. Right. But, um, so I went in on that Friday and they're like, yeah, everything looks great. Your labs look great. You're ready for Monday. Just one little issue. Your pregnancy test came back indiscriminate. And I was like, what does that mean? They're like, oh, don't worry. It could just be your HGC levels or something. I don't remember exactly what they said verbatim, but they're like, we've only seen this where one time the lady come, came back pregnant. Every other time it was just, you know, a glitch or da da da. So I was like, okay, what do I need to do? They're like, well, you need to go back to the lab and get another uh, blood test so they can do the pregnancy test. And they gave me the um, prescription or whatever it is they write for me to go to lab core or wherever the heck I went. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. And um, my, it was already almost five. So the lab was closed. So they're like, okay, well you can just go Monday morning, like just go 6am as long as they have enough time, we can still do the the surgery Monday. I'm like, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So then she's like, is there any chance to get pregnant? I was like, no, like, nah, no. So I had a hair appointment after that. I go to my hair appointment and on the way I stopped at a CVS across the street and got a pregnancy test. Mm-hmm. And I was like, just for shits and giggles. Like, I know I'm not pregnant. And I got the one that tells you how far along you are. I was like, let me just get the most advanced one. So um, I'm sitting in the hair chair getting my hair done. And I'm like, I'm going to go to the bathroom real quick. I go to the bathroom and I take the pregnancy test. I'm taking it in the bathroom at the hair salon because I know I'm not pregnant. Like, right. if I knew I was pregnant, I wouldn't be at the, the public you bathroom. forgot about the prior shooting the club up? Well, I mean, I thought I took not precautions, post-cautions. Oh, really? Of okay. my own fruition. Okay, but those I, don't always work. I found that out. Really? Okay. <laughs> See, if I were to have administered one of those, I would just be thinking like, okay, we're good. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm, I, hey, I did what I needed to do. Right, because the truth I, is, I'm is that to anybody. you could shoot the club up and not get anybody's over and over and over. <laughs> like once you actually start trying to have a kid, you kind of realize like, oh, this is not as easy as right. you assume. Right. So then especially if you take something to. Right. Yeah, right. Wow, and and you know, at, at that point I was just being a grown woman now, just it sounds so stupid. I was sneaking plan B pills. Like when he wasn't looking, when he wasn't paying attention, I was like finding ways to, to mm. go get them instead of just being an adult and be like, Hey, how many babies did he already have at that point? So at that point, I only knew about two. But there was a bunch more? There was only one more. Doesn't he have like seven total or some it's shit? Five. 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 Um, really, everybody seems like they're kind of not doing too much compared to young boy. He got 12. And he's like 23 or something. Isn't that like, oh, he can do the whole 12 day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Like, Kick all, and get all a different day. Elves, yeah. That's crazy. That's gonna be cute one day. Um, so yeah. at the time, there was only two that I knew of. Mm-hmm. The numbers have gone up and down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, whatever. Not gonna. Anyway, so I remember someone banging on the bathroom door, and I don't know how long I was in there because mm-hmm. I blacked out. And they're like, "You okay?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah." So I came back down, and now like I'm getting my hair done. And I, I can't even text anybody because I don't want the hairdresser to see mm. what I'm saying. So I'm just sitting there like in a fog. Like I don't even remember. And then I left the hair salon and then I just drove straight to the studio. Again, I had, had a session with Party Next Door. And I'm just driving and I'm just sitting there like just, I just walk in the studio and he's like, shots up. I'm like, oh, ah, ee, I can't take one a day. Ah, it made me so sick yesterday. And um, I called, I called Kari's father and um, he didn't answer. And he texted me. He was, I think he was like on a plane or something. He was like, I'll call you when I land. I was like, we kind of need to talk. 
And um, so I was just sitting there. Party was in the booth and he called me back and I just left the studio, got in my car to, to, to talk to him, tell him what was going on. And I just drove and left and, and never came back. And he was like, you going to leave the studio? I don't know. But um, so at that point, from that day forward, like everything changed for me, like literally everything. Um, I had to just, you know, decide to put on my big girl panties. And um, yeah. And your relationship with him deteriorated from there? No. Or? So we had broken up before I found out I was pregnant. Really? Okay. Yeah. Everyone thinks, oh, he left me because I was pregnant. No. It was already falling apart. Yeah. And, okay. you know, but I mean, at that point, like uh, we would break up for three days and then like go on a, 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 a week binge, you know, mm. just madly in love and then toxic love and then, and then break up again for two days and then break up for two, you know? So at that point, like we were on one of our little things and I'm oh. thinking at that point, he was the one that wanted to have a baby. So I'm like, well, at least, at least when I tell him he's going to be happy about it mm -hmm. and he wasn't happy. He wasn't unhappy. He's just, you know, it just didn't go how I thought it was going to go. You thought he was going to be ready to settle down more so? Or? No, I didn't think he was going to be ready to settle down because, I mean, he was a 24-year-old Not settle rock down, star, but, you know, but become more serious with you? No. no? I mean, okay. he, 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 he had expressed wanting to be serious from the beginning. Um, I just thought that maybe the, the on-again, off-again was going to be le less. Like, okay. you know, like the highs were very high. The lows were very low. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I, one thing, you know, that I realized, and we've even discussed this, you know, as time progressed, um, you know, being that young and being at the pinnacle and the peak of his career, um, I think that he decided that I'm somebody he wanted to keep in his life, but not at that time. Cause he wanted to go do whatever he wanted to do. Mm. So I think for him, that was like, whoop, great. And you weren't a woman who could just be like, listen, I understand you're a rapper. You're at the top of your career. You can fuck other girls. I'm just going to, like, ignore it. Yes and no. I think at that time, I would not have been open to a relationship like that. Okay. But I think we could have definitely been more cordial to, like, where we had gotten years after. Like, again, I you, you're he was a 24-year-old rapper at the peak of his career so not saying that I don't re deserve or respect you know absolute loyalty but like let's be real here like it's a respectful way to do things a respectful way to handle things and you know one thing he would do let's say we would be you know on Rodeo shopping or you know family time or just hanging out he'd be at the house and you know, just, just doing everything and, I mean, having the time of our lives. He would have a show. I would drop him off at the airport. He would land and some random girl would pick him up from the airport and he'd be on her camera throwing up gang signs and da, 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 just Like, you're not even trying to be discreet about it. Right. And then Shade Room would post it. Oh, yeah. And then I would hit him like, what the fuck? And he wouldn't say anything. And the next day, it would be a different city, a different girl, and more gang signs. And then it'd get posted <laughs> again. And the next city, another girl. And, like, you left three days. I dropped you off at the airport. And you and you haven't said a word to me in those three days. No, no text, nothing. Nothing. Ignore me completely. Wow. Then day, five, day four... Pop my back in the house. And just expect to walk, walk the in. Oh, holy shit. Drop a, a stack of money on the counter and be like, oh, babe, I had a long weekend. It's kind of badass, though. What? Admit it. It's kind of badass. And, like, <laughs> for me at that time, I'm like, are you shitting me? Right. I'm going to count this money that you just put on the counter, but are you shitting me? But, like. I think just being that young and that powerful and that wealthy, mm. he just didn't know yeah. how to handle things. Like we didn't have to be in a relationship to still co-parent and just, you know, be adults. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, mm. man, the stories I could tell that I won't. Jesus. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it. But okay. So after that though, how long were you single doing the single mom thing? And what was it like uh, dating in that? I mean, um, so up until Kari was about three, almost four, 
uh, we were on and off, mm-hmm. on and off. Um, you know, I, I dated a little here and there, but my priority is always my daughter. So I'm not one of those people that have men around my kid. Um, you're not pulling up at my house. I'm not coming to your house. So for me, like, I would kind of entertain like an ex-boyfriend or something or, you know, somebody that I felt like was worth the time because I just always, I, I'm such a mom, mm-hmm. you know? So for a long time, um, I didn't really, you know, do all the things that I would normally want to do. Mm. Um, because it's like, how far can this really go? You know, I don't see you as a stepdad. So <laughs> unless you're possessing those qualities, and then I'm with my kid all the time. I'm not going to be running in the streets without her. And you're not going to be around my kid if I don't feel like you're, in, you know. So dating was interesting. It's a tricky role. It's a tricky role. A lot of these, like, uh, men's rights, like, uh, red pill type podcasts, like, the way <laughs> they talk about single moms just comes off so mean to me. And as, it's so weird because most of their moms are those. Right. And, I mean, I get it. Like, I understand that. It definitely is like a very big decision to start dating a woman seriously who already has kids. You know, it's like it's just like you kind of have to be at the point in your life where you're ready to, you know, take on some small percentage of the responsibility that being a dad is. Realistically, yeah. if you're going to get serious, it's just going to become yeah. more and more like they're your kids as you spend more yeah. time with them. But it just feels so like shitty to just like talk about them the way that some of them do. And I realize that I'm only saying this probably because. I'm in the state where I could imagine like my wife being in that position uh-huh. if something were to happen to me or if, right. if it didn't work out, whatever. And it's just like, I don't know. It just feels so shitty to kind of talk about single moms. Like, that. you know what I've, know. I've noticed just in my personal experience and with a lot of my friends, um, I can't say never, but I've, I've never personally experienced a man that was like, Oh, you have kids. Bye. Really? You know? And, and, I've always, like Beyonce said, I'm everybody's type, okay? (laughs) You know, obviously, um, I've been married for almost three years now. But, like, before that, like, I've always been approached by very affluent men and the garbage men, too. Pretty privilege. Talk to us about pretty privilege. What's it like? (laughs) I mean, what do you want to know? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I'm just saying. It's like that clearly probably, like, colors your Um, life story in a way when you're like, oh, like, guys treat me like a certain way throughout my life because I'm assuming you looked pretty good when you were 18 or whatever. You know, okay, this this is what I will say. I'm not going to, I'm not going to act like it does not exist. I'm not going to try to be like, oh, it's not, you know, no, pretty privilege is a thing and I use it Mm. to my full advantage as much as I possibly can. I I absolutely do. I feel like, you know, Marilyn Monroe said it takes a smart brunette to play a dumb blonde. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I've had people like, oh, you're too, you're too pretty to use your looks. You're, you're, are you stupid? No, that I'm smart. Mm. You use what you got to get what you want to a certain extent. Yeah. Now, now, I'm not going to exploit myself to the pl- to the point where it becomes you know something else. But th- at the end of the day, like we know, men are physical beings. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times where you may they may be interested because of how you look, but your brain or your ability or your mouth will close the deal. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of rooms and, and doors that open for me or places that I got into because I was the unassuming pretty girl. Like, oh, she, she's pretty, but she don't know shit. Mm-hmm. And then they found out, oh, it speaks. Oh, it thinks. Oh, it's smart. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, I've, I've been approached by, you name them, all the blue checks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and all the blue collar workers. Right. You know? Um, so nothing really surprises me or impresses me or, you know, anything like that. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, I don't know. It's a thing. It's a thing. Right. I mean, it's just like, as a woman, you have this sort of like passport that can get you wherever you want to go. If you look a certain way. True. Very true. And, you know, it's just kind of crazy because it's like, Women just can do that, but they also are kind of potentially sacrificing some amount of reputational damage that they might be doing, especially if it becomes this public thing. You know, men have the same passport if they have money. True, true. So a lot of doors that I can get in because of how I look, you can get in because of you can pay for it. Yeah, you know but what I'm it took a lot of work to get to that point. Whereas yeah. you've had that superpower presumably since you were very young. Right? Yes and no. Yes and no because I've seen pretty that ain't put together. Right. Okay, and, and that's and and that's country pretty, and mm-hmm. and that's cool. That's unrefined pretty, 
And that's fine too. But like there's certain places that, you know, you need sweetie, you have to use a pearl spoon for the caviar. Mm. Like See, I wouldn't know that. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. <laughs> there's certain places, you know, so it, it's it, it is different categories of it too. You know, and then Again, a lot of times you may be in the room because you're pretty, but that don't keep you in the room. Oh, or if it does keep you in the room, you may be in, in a different spot in that room. You may be in the bed in the room. Right. You know? So pretty is the introduction, but are you intelligent? Can you mm. hold a conversation? Do you know what the hell you're talking about? Right. You know, is there is there something else outside of that? And some people care about that. Some people don't. Right. You know, I just want people to start to, to stop trying to vandalize women who are pretty that are with affluent men. It's not like she tackled you and beat you down. The affluent men that look like King Koopa or, or, <laughs> or God knows what a, a villain, they're going after the pretty women. You know, I heard Irv Gotti, he was on a podcast and I was just sitting there like, are you mad? What the way he was talking about Ashanti? Oh God. Or are you talking about something? I else? wasn't even talking about that, but oh, that okay. was, the, it, that was what men used to deny the stuff he was making jokes of. Right. And I like just kind of laughing about victimizing and womanizing and misogyny and making a joke of it. Like that was gross, but that wasn't even what I was to, that's a whole different topic. Okay. But he, it was like maybe a week or two ago and he was saying something about how he, I don't know how old he is, but I think he was, I think he's like 52 ish or something. And, um, he, he was saying how he was dating a 25-year-old Dominican girl. He couldn't believe she wanted $25,000 for him. You just said that you're dating this beautiful, drop-dead gorgeous 25-year-old girl who is m more than half of your age. Uh -huh. I don't know if he has kids, but you, you can, you, if you do or don't, your child could be older than her. You're with her because she is beautiful and supple and young you have the audacity to be using her for her youth and her body and her looks. And you said you couldn't believe she asked for $25,000. Well, I mean, these are negotiations. Maybe he's already given her her stipend for the month, right? Well, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was just it was just the way he was so appalled. Mm. But what if she said on a podcast, yeah, this old 52-year-old washed up man who used to have the audacity to ask me to sleep with him. Uh-huh. Well, she already made that decision, presumably, right? She was out. Right. She had her own free will to not sleep with him. Of course, and I'm not. I'm not saying that. Like, like, let's be honest about an even exchange here. Right. If you're, if you know, if you are, if you are broke, that girl wouldn't talk to you. Right. And if you know that, then you know what you're bringing to her. And if she, she was fat, you wouldn't want her. So you want her for what she looks like. And she wants you for what you have. If that's what the exchange is, then what are you appalled about? Now, if if it was something different, like, oh, I met her at Bible school and she's just a genius or, you know, she's, I can't, like, did she catch you off guard? That's the weird thing, though. If you're Irv Gotti, like, like what kind of fucking relationship are you going to end up in that isn't kind of predicated on the fact a that you've got a lot of money? A relationship with a woman his age. Who's yeah. well established? He doesn't want that. Right. Well, I mean, he doesn't want it's that. a free country. Why not? Right. Right. But in the same, it is a free country. You don't want a woman in your age bracket that w is interested in golfing. You want a bad bitch that wants money. Right. So don't but worry. Do about you it. look down on a Leonardo DiCaprio that chooses to just date like twenty something year old women? I'm not going to say 20s. I look down on somebody, but I it it, it is a little pedophilic. <laughs> I mean, little, his current girlfriend's 25. That's not pedophilic. A, well, That's no, seven years removed from her being of age. No, right? no, no. It's not pedophilic because she's 25. Because he do be but, having some 18 and 19 But olds, when right? she was 10, how old were you? Right, but he didn't know That's that, the right? weird part to me. To me, that's the weird part. It's weird. It's definitely a weird thing if you knew her when she was super young. Like, if you knew her when she was a baby, and then one day, 20 years later, she's 21, and you end up dating her. I don't know. I'm like, I, I can't say it's wrong because I've just never been in that position. Yeah. But holy fuck, that's got to feel fucking weird. So who is it that, oh God, which actor is it? Is it Robert De Niro? Oh, he's like 70. And who he, is it? It's like two actors in their 70s to 80s that just yeah. had babies with like women in their 20s. And then broke up immediately. That to me, like that is, a, that's sick. <laughs> because you lived six decades before this person was born. 
Right. Five, six decades. You On your 50th birthday, were they even conceived? That is weird. Right. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. And that makes me wonder, what did you do that we don't know about with children? Because you've got a ticking time bomb tied around your neck when you're that old. Like, it might not be tomorrow. It might not be next week. And but and you're, is, you're dying soon. It's selfish. Having a kid when you're, like, presumed to be dead in five or five to ten years. I mean, I don't know. Like yeah. At 82 or 80 or however old he was, having a kid. Like, God, God bless you with long life longevity. Please. But, like... You're not going to be 110. If it's weird to have a kid and then abandon them, it's also weird to have a kid when you know that you're going to abandon them soon by dying. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. The question, the only question is, is how late is too late for a guy to responsibly have kids? Exactly. Because, but then also, you know, I mean, at 82, you probably don't think you can, you, your swimmers are swimming. If I'm 55 and I still have a good amount of money, I'm definitely assuming that I'm probably going to want to make another kid, right? Because 55 isn't old. That'd be fun. Yeah. But that'd be a great way to spend the last yeah. 20, 30 years of my life. That's awesome. That's, yeah. You know, that's a different story. But like 80 something, 70 something. Oh, hell. That's fucking crazy. That's crazy. It's insane that a guy could even get a girl pregnant when they're that old. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, how the fuck is my cum going to still do anything? But the way I anything? feel, I think maybe like he had no idea that he could still do that type of thing. That's, he's probably busting everywhere. Right. Yeah. Like, like I just don't see in, in, in his, like, let me get you pregnant. I don't know. I don't know. But also, <laughs> once you have enough money, it's like, well, you're set who for gives life a I mean, that's clearly why something like the rappers that we've been talking about are okay with having so many babies. They just feel like they can afford it forever. And yeah, you whether you can afford it or not, your kid needs you. Here's a question you probably won't answer, honestly. How does it feel having your uh, baby daddy getting locked up for trafficking drugs? Oh, it sucks. Is that something you knew about while it was happening? See? Mm, Not answering honestly. Listen! <laughs> listen! <laughs> if you weren't uh, involved, I don't mm, think you could catch a case. But what I'm not a lawyer. What did wife say? She knew nothing about anything. There you go. That's good, yeah. You know... <laughs> um, I know how it affects my daughter. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so, you know, we had a little time to kind of prepare. Mm -hmm. Um, but even in that, you know, how do you, how do you really, how do you, yeah. yeah, How do you do that? Like, how do you, and then, um, I'm not going to say we were blindsided by it, but, um, you know, my daughter had no idea Mm -hmm. and even, even leading up to it. You know, we're trying to figure out, okay, what to tell her, how to tell her. Um, and he wanted me to do it. And I was like, get somebody else to do it. <laughs> you do it. Like, mm. I'm, no. What did you tell a seven-year-old? Yeah. Right. Uh, at the time, was she six mm. or was she seven? No, I think, well, I think she was seven when he actually went went in. Um, no, she was, she was six. So she was going to miss her seventh. He was going to miss her seventh birthday. And that was the first birthday that he would actually miss. Well, he missed her fourth birthday because of quarantine hit right then. Right. He still, you know, paid for her party. We ended up doing a quarantine tea party. I had the huge party planned and quarantine hit two days, three days before her party. Mm. So we did the party with all her stuffed animals and no guests. And she loved it. Um, But yeah, so we, you know, we were getting prepared for that. And, um, you know, when he first went in, we didn't tell her for a couple, couple months. And she's like, trying to figure out what's going on. You know, we're doing the phone calls. And, you know, as he's talking to her, she's like, I want to FaceTime you. And he's like, oh, daddy can't FaceTime you. And, um, you know, something's going on. And, you know, and then they have the whatever that thing that comes in. This this is a call from a federal prison. So every time that would come on, like I would try to like distract her, you know. So we just, it got to the point where we're like, okay, you got to tell her on this day. But like, then it was like, okay, wait, she has this coming up. She has this coming up. Just trying to figure out the best time. There is no best time. Right. You know, so. Because you, know. you just know that they're not going to be able to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he tried to explain it like, you know, daddy's in detention. Yeah. Um, Type type thing. And, you know, every little girl, you would want their father to be their superhero. You know, so it, 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 it was hard for her and it's still hard for her. But, you know, thankfully, you know, my husband takes a lot of that. A lot mm. of that. You know, he's very active with her. Uh, he's very hands-on with her. 
you know, they have their own little special bond. And, you know, so I'm 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 very appreciative of that. Even before, you know, he went into jail. So Right. Okay. It's got to be weird for you to have gone from getting involved with this guy and he's in a certain position in life and then having things end up like this. Weird is an understatement. You never could have <laughs> expected this in a million years. Oh, gosh. If you would have told me this, I would have called you every type of liar. Yeah. yeah. Every time. If we could go back in time and we're having this and I was telling you that, you would say, what the fuck are you talking about? This guy's a psycho. Get him off the stage. Literally. I would call you names. Yeah. You know, because, you know, from... Taking your daughter to see her father in sold out arenas to now, do I have to take her to a prison? Oof. Who would who would think that? You know, but, you know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he's going to do his time and he's going to come home. When you make plans, God laughs. Man, doesn't he? Not really a big God guy myself, but it's a good, good saying. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so true. <laughs> it's so true. There's moments in my life where I'm like, this is the, 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 this is going better than I could ever imagine. Thank you, God. Right. And this time I'm like, wait, hold on, God, hold on, wait, wait a minute, God, 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 hey, mm-hmm. hey, hey. <laughs> right. But, you know, it, it's life. So what happened with the guy that you ended up getting married to? How'd you meet him? Mm-hmm. I don't know who he is, by the way. Just, uh, I don't know if he's like famous or anything. I'm probably going to sound crazy, but I, I don't know. We met 13 years ago at a club I was hosting in Houston. 13 years? 13, wow. 13 years so ago. So right before you moved to California? Yes, literally. And he told me he was moving to California, too. Mm. And when he didn't, I was like, don't have time for you. And we just kind of stayed in touch, like platonically. And then, you know, over three years ago, we just accidentally, literally accidentally started dating. Mm. Right as quarantine started or? During quarantine, yeah. Not right as quarantine started, but like, again, for me, like, I didn't allow people in my personal space. I didn't, I didn't you know, allow people to come to my house and stuff like that. So for me, it was like. We, I couldn't go on, go to, couldn't go out on dates, and I wasn't going to have men coming to my house. Was I he did. pursuing you hard though? Because you probably have to work kind of hard to make it happen. Oh, when I mean, yeah, you're definitely doing the mom thing. You know? Yeah, definitely. But like during that time, like he was, he was my friend, so you know he had been to my house plenty of times and stuff like that. So I was only having people that I knew that I was comfortable with to come over my house. Like it wasn't like a thing. And so he was really your friend. Like you didn't feel like he was low-key in love with you during this time? I mean... And was there a part of you that felt like that towards him? So, during the 10 years that we knew each other at that time, we flirted a little, you know, here and there. But, like, me, I'm one of those people, like, if if, if on the day that I'm into you or the day that I'm considering it, you don't meet the criteria, I'm out, I'm off, I'm out of here. Like, I ain't got time. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I, I used to be such a... Bah, well, what about as a woman, you kind of got to be like that yeah. to, to not get walked all over by guys. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so you, you end up with all these hot girls who have like the thickest skin and they just are impossible to communicate with because they're so used to fuck boys. Yeah. Treating them a certain way, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you, exactly. got, you got that armor built up, right? Exactly. And and especially during that time, like, I mean, you know, I, I felt like I could pick anyone I wanted to. Right. You know. Well, not I felt like I could, and I and if I wasn't married, I still would. But I, you know, we, we don't have that. When you're a babe, the the world's <laughs> your oyster. You know, so um, as as you know, during quarantine, you know, we we started hanging out more because again, like I said, okay, you know, there's someone that I can have around. And during that time, that was probably like the first time that I actually took to like get to know him, and deeper than just hanging out in public or deeper than like, oh, we can go to dinner, we can this, we can do that. And as we started to have conversations and, and things like that, I'm like, oh, he's he's really smart. Oh, he's really talented. Oh, he's really this. He's really that. And, you know, I just started to get to know him in a different way that I never, never had before. And mm-hmm. it just kind of, you know, changed the whole, the whole perception, the whole idea. And um, yeah, that's, it, 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 we just accidentally, like just kind of accidentally, hey, Right. Woke up one day and was like, we're in a full relationship. <laughs> and you got married. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Where'd you do it? Um, Las Vegas. Oh. We got married during quarantine, du- during COVID. You had like a big wedding there? No. Oh. So we, we are still, pl- we're, we have the big wedding planned. Uh, but when okay. we got married, the world was still closed. Mm, but you just wanted to do it really bad? Yeah. Yeah. So we just decided we were just going to do it. Right. And the crazy thing is I got COVID the day before or the day we got married. I'm not sure. I woke up the next morning half dead. Really? Yeah. It was, After your wedding? Yeah. <laughs> I almost died. Like it was, 
It was a bad, it was t- like we didn't get to well we couldn't really honeymoon anywhere because it was it was COVID. But um, I had COVID once, possibly twice, and the shit was fucking. Yeah, brutal. I had it definitely once, maybe twice. But Same. Yeah. I thought I was dying. I was miserable. And oh, yeah, the day, too. the day after we got married, I woke up like. It took me months to feel normal. Yeah, it, it definitely takes a toll. On yeah, you, for sure. It's a hell of a thing. But um, okay, so what do you like actually do in your life at this point? Like we, because you know, obviously you were getting a little annoyed by Sharp, like bringing up the reality TV as if that was like no, yesterday. It, but it wasn't that that was annoying because again, you don't it, like being reduced to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anything I've done in the past is what I've done, and he even mentioned something like, "Oh, so you're proud of that?" I'm like, "This is the road I've taken to get." To this place right. it's not a sense of pride or a sense of of, of uh, grief or any, or anything like that it's just this is the steps I've taken to get mm-hmm. to this place so um, yeah I quit loving hip hop in 2017 uh, I quit growing up hip hop in 2018 um, since then I've done quite a few things um, I am a singer and actress as well I've mm-hmm. um, done quite a few movies commercials and you know things like that TV shows sitcoms since loving hip hop that didn't I guess that people don't know about as much as Love and Hip Hop, but the craziest thing is when I go on sets to film these movies and these shows, I'm with way higher build actors that have way less of a following or way less popularity. However, they've done a million, you know, movies that have way bigger accolades, which just goes to show you again, people only care about the negative because it doesn't really translate into your like social media following yeah exactly but roles, yeah. exactly but but their imdb page is stacked through the ceiling you know what i'm saying amazing actors and actresses that i've been blessed to work with whereas you know me my resume is still good but it's not as extensive but i'm the one that people know because of the drama or whatever you know but i mean it is what it is you know i, I appreciate what i've been able to accomplish because of it um, I'm a singer as well, of course. You know, I'm still making music. I have new songs that are dropping that I can't wait to put out. We're putting out a whole EP. Um, and I have a single called Narcissist that I'm dropping, followed by um, a single called Done Now. It's about Sharp? It's actually not, but I'm... Well, you did you, use that word to describe him earlier. You know, it was very narcissistic. <laughs> it was very narcissistic. Um, I I have never, nor will I ever write anything with the sharpened mind. Oh, really? Damn. You know, but one thing, I've never wrote a love song. Really? I've never wrote a love song. I've never been in the place where I felt like I could do it justice. I'm an amazing writer, which I think people don't know about me yet. And I can't wait for them to realize that I'm, I'm amazingly talented musically, whether it's singing, writing, rapping, or just listening, a and ring vocal arranging, piecing things together. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, it's, it's, I'm a different person when I'm in the studio. So I've been working really hard, and I'm really excited, you know, to get in, in into more of that. Um, so, yeah, Narcissus is my next single. Mm-hmm. Um, I have two singles with some really cool features I'm super excited about. Um, so I'm dropping three singles, three videos, and then we're dropping the EP. And, I, I mean, I have... So so much music recorded. I'm just gonna be putting it out. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote my first movie, really, um, based off roughly based off of my life, uh, my lifestyle before kids. Mm. <laughs> um, we didn't really get super into that. Were you have like a? Were you really wild? I wouldn't say I was wilder than anybody else, but I I mean I I just I lived my life. Right. I lived my life, and you know what I tell everybody: before you have kids, be as selfish as you can be. Because when you have children, it's about them. They didn't ask to be here and suck it up. No one cares what you want to do anymore. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, you still have to have a life, of course, but your children become that priority. Right. Um, so, you know, before having kids, I went wherever I wanted to go, hop on a plane any second, date whoever I wanted to date. I just had a, the time of my life. Uh-huh. So I wrote a movie kind of based off the me and the building I lived in and the experiences that happened and just kind of things around it. Um, so look for that. Now with the writer strike and the actor strike, I'm not going to get too much in it because I do want to respect SAG mm-hmm. and, and things like that. Um, the dates are going to be pushed back a little bit because of that. Uh, yesterday they finally reached their first agreement with the writers. Thankfully, hopefully SAG will be following in suit um, because we should be starting production very soon. But again, mm-hmm. we are going to respect the strike. So um, as soon as 
that strike has been lifted. We will be starting production. I will be doing castings. I'm super excited. I'm also one of the main characters. Mm -hmm. And this is my first movie that I wrote. I wrote four TV shows as well. Um, And yeah, so I am now a writer and a producer as well as an actress. So that's exciting. Um, Yeah. Are you like, okay, your one kid is seven. I have a seven-year-old. I have a... my baby girl will be one in two weeks. Oh, okay. So you did end up having another baby. Yeah, she'll be one in two weeks. Really? Okay. Yeah. So how's that going? Um, is she, uh, I'm obsessed. Uh-huh. I'm obsessed. It's, 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 you know, different starting over. Uh-huh. Like, you know, Cardi's a big girl. So now it's like, oh, wait, I have to start everything over. Um, so it's, it's definitely a challenge because, you know, I'm, I'm super mom. So I'm with my daughter all the time. Right. You know, but thankfully, you know, during COVID, I picked up another f- side gig that I didn't mean to. I didn't even know about with the stock market. Mm. Um, so, I, you know, I'm an avid investor and I wrote a workbook called Stock Market Tips from a Bad Bitch. You can get it at stockmarkettipsfromabadbitch.com. And it teaches you the easiest way to learn the stock market. You know, I was investing before um, COVID, but I had my financial advisors. And after when COVID hit, I looked at my accounts and after four years, I made $10,000. Mm-hmm. I make that in my sleep. I'm like, that's, that's like at, at that time, that wasn't even my, my day rate was way more than that. Like in four years, I made less than my day rate. So I'm like, there's no way, like, how am I making, you know? And again, I had advisors that were investing for me, but I didn't really understand anything. So when COVID hit and, and I had five TV contracts that were on hold. And I'm like, how the hell am I going to make this type of money? Like I have Kari Barbie Beauty, my cosmetic line. You know, I have my music. I have residuals, but nothing is going to make me money like it does when I show up to that set. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I got to figure out this investing thing. So I just kind of got on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, just started doing my own research and getting in the market and opening my own accounts and doing my own trades and just learning and figuring it out. And within four weeks, I made more than I made in four years. Right. You know, so I just started kind of like tweeting tips and stuff. And people started like asking me questions. And they were getting really aggressive. Like, tell me what to do. And I'm like, okay, I, I tweeted about that two weeks ago. Well, if you ain't going to tell me, then da-da. I don't work for you. I'm just giving free tips, guys. <laughs> and I, I got to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm not giving out free tips anymore. Because people were really being nasty. Like they thought they paid me for this information. And I'm like, I'm just one person just trying to help you guys. I'm, I'm tweeting what I'm learning as I'm learning. Like, I, I barely even know. Mm. So then I had, you know, a lot of people were like, no, this has helped me so much. Like, I've made this amount because of what you said. And you told me to buy Apple on this day. And you said, to, you know, this. And so they're like, can you at least make a private stock club? So I, so I linked with OnlyFans and made a private stock club on OnlyFans. And um, that was going really well, but they wanted more. So I ended up turning my chicken scratch notes into a workbook. And, um, you know, that, that did that did really well. And, you know, one thing that's really important for me is I don't want to just be somebody that's made it and my fan base or my following or the people that support me haven't. And they're, you know, they're sitting at home poor with with no money, just watching me eating caviar and champagne (laughs) and whenever I feel like it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, that that happens. But, you know, it's not too often that you see somebody that has made it to a certain level of success that tries to, you know, make sure that their fan base does, too. You know, so I remember the first, the, the only concert that I've ever paid to go to, my first and last concert ever buying tickets to was a Usher concert. I was 18, me and my girlfriends, we saved up money. We paid like $214 for these floor seats that ended up being shitty. And, um, you know, we got our outfits, we got a driver and all this stuff. And, you know, the, that's the reason why it's the only concert I ever paid to, because after that I became famous and now I never had to pay. <laughs> I just always went. But um, Usher was like my favorite artist. He had this song, um... What, what did he say? Dinner reservations and no boo, Mr. Charles, you just pick the location. And I used to sing it, but I would say. Because you couldn't tell what he was saying? I had no idea. <laughs> it wasn't until I moved to L.A. and got a little money and started right. dating men with money that I was sitting at Nobu one day. Got to go to Nobu, huh? And I was at Mr. Charles one day. And it just hit me like, and no boo, Mr. I was too poor to understand what he was saying. I was too, I was at Applebee's. I was at, <laughs> I was at Steak and Shake. Right. You know, so my favorite artist that I've saved up months and months of my summer camp money to go see 
and I'm singing these songs and 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 to to my at the top of my lungs, and I don't even know what he's saying because I couldn't afford to even understand. I didn't. I never heard of Nobu. I never heard of Mr. Childs. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't until I got to financially able. It. I, I never want, and I, never is a strong word, but I want you know the people that that support me, the people that spend money with me, the people that buy my products, the people that listen to my music. I don't want them to scrape pennies to be able to afford to, to support me. Right. You know what I'm saying? So the stock market tips thing for me and teaching financial literacy, that was something that I wanted to do to, to give my following, my fan base, the people that support me, like, listen, I want you to make money too. Like, I I don't want to be singing about champagne and caviar and you, you drinking ginger ale scraping up bills you know the choice is yours obviously you you can't force anyone to do any, anything but you know it's just really in, in, important to me to try and give opportunity for people to you know find it a better way how how sticky is the fan base that you get from doing something like love and hip-hop since you've been away from it for many years like do you feel like they still follow you or is it or do they have like a short attention span uh a lot of them are still here. Really? A lot of them are still. Instagram deleted my page like 10 times. They Oh, oh really? They hate me. I had to start completely over from scratch. 10 times? What are you posting? Nothing. Do you have powerful ops? I wouldn't say powerful. It's just so many of them. Sometimes I think that, well, especially in the past however many years, it felt like if people just didn't like you, then they could get your Instagram taken down. Yes. And now it feels like maybe it's not as much like if that. If enough but, people report you, they can. But there was a while where it was so bad. Yeah, um, honestly, like, Instagram made up a fake reason why they deleted me. Really? And I got to the bottom of it. Like, I actually know people there, and it was a whole big thing. But um, basically, if enough people report you, they can delete you. And there's a policy that says public figures cannot disparage private people. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing that stops private people from disparaging public people. So they can attack me all they want, all day long. And if I say, shut up, I can get deleted, blocked restricted my monetization taken away from me anything if a it, it doesn't matter what they say to me you can put a bullseye on my head which has happened photos you can say all types of disgusting things about my children which has happened if i say yo mama right and they say oh i get deleted <laughs> hey why'd you say you hate vlad i didn't say i hate him i said he can kiss my ass or something like that i think why um you know i was talking like I talk about a topic that had nothing to do with him. And it's, it's, an, it's kind of like that narcissism thing like that Sharp did. <laughs> we are talking about a topic that had nothing to do with you. Didn't affect you whatsoever. I can't even tell you exactly what it was. It was something about a Richard Millie. And I just said, me personally, I think they're ugly. Now, that's a very expensive watch. Extremely expensive watch. Right. I just personally don't like them. I said that it looks like a fancy G-Shock to me. <laughs> and it was just something I was saying on Twitter. And he jumped in to tell, to say what I could afford, what I couldn't afford, and don't speak about things you can't this and you can't that, and making comments about like uh, I don't. It was it just got to the extreme, like like how I where I live. And first of all, I, I bought a two point six million dollar house by myself. Um, like comments like just just being ignorant. The fact that I personally don't like the way Richard Millie's look. How did that affect you? I have to read the receipts on this because that doesn't really. It was weird. I would think that Vlad would it have was, a similar attitude. Of I would like, think just because it's expensive doesn't he, mean you have to like it. Right? He came for me, at, and this was a. It was a topic like it was, it was. I don't know. I think Meek Mill had posted a Richard Mill. I don't remember who or what, but again, it was a topic that everyone was commenting on. So why you'd felt the need to come and attack me is crazy. But I personally know that you've given people interviews specifically to talk about me mm -hmm. when I never met you. And it was people that you would never interview that you gave a platform to just literally come there and, and rant about Masika. Who? I want to see it. I'll go, I'm not I'll, giving none I'll of these folks attention. I'll I'm going to search Vlad Masika later. See what, but see I've, what never, I've never been on Vlad's show. Really? Ever. So it's like, how did me talking about a Richard Millie on Twitter, like, it was weird. And I, I went the fuck off on him and he never replied he never responded but like i feel like vlad's a culture vulture in what way i feel like he exploits black people as much as he possibly can 
Um, the man won't even show his face. He's not even on camera. He's a voice. He goes on camera a good amount. Maybe. I'm, may, okay. Well, but, I don't pay attention enough to know. I mean, but, but what is what is what he's doing? How different is it from what everybody else is doing? You know, I'm not going to say how super different it is. I just feel like he was one of the leaders of it. He he definitely kind of invented a lot of things that became incredibly commonplace. Yeah. And now when you look at what the average creator looks like in the sort of hip hop space or whatever, whether it's a math off a, or an academics or a me or whatever, we're all kind of following a very similar blueprint to what Vlad was doing yeah. in like 2010 or whatever, which is right. pretty incredible when you really, like he kind of just like saw how things were going to play out. But he, he definitely took a lot of shit. Same way academics took so much shit for like a lot of the more like gossipy shit or like just con like posting about people who died and showing videos of whatever, mm -hmm. or whatever he, he kind of got known for with the whole war in Chirac thing. But that, that shit like is so normal now. Yeah. His act took so yeah. much shit for being like one of the first people to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, Vlad was probably one of the pioneers of what is so common now. Mm. Um, but it's just it's just so strange to me when men attack women for saying their opinion that has nothing to do with them. Mm. I can understand if I tagged you, if I mentioned you. What did me not liking a Richard Milley do to you? It was mm. just weird. It was just weird. He's never addressed it, never said anything else after that. But it was just so weird. Like, mm. how did that bother you? I gotta find these receipts. Yeah, it's on Twitter. Okay, it's on Twitter. Um, <laughs> how like on the scene do you feel like you're at, at this point? Because it's like partially, it seems like you're probably like kind of focused on the mom thing and everything. Are you outside like at when this I point? Need to be. Do you want to be? Is like because I feel like I'm so removed from that. I'm at this point. I'm super removed, but yeah. you know when I need to be, I, I I'm you know obviously I'm still an artist. I'm still an actress. I'm still you know promoting different things. So there are times where okay, you know what, I gotta go. I got to go do certain things. I got to do press. I got to do this. I got to do that. But I'm, I'm so far, like, I'm, I'm really far removed from the scene. Um, you know, I like to go to, to fancy restaurants, have champagne and caviar with my friends. I like to, you know, eat a medium rare bone in filet and go home. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, I don't really like doing the club thing anymore unless, it, unless it's conducive to something. Like if I'm hosting a party or a friend's hosting a party or, you know, something like that. Or my friends own the club or, you know, um, we're doing a launch or a celebration. But um, I'm I'm usually in bed in, in my jammies, uh, you know, with with a baby foot in my face or something, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, I pop out when I need to. And, um, you know, but don't get it twisted. When I pop out, it pops out. Really? Okay. <laughs> Would you do reality TV again? Or Woo! is your life too boring at this point? Do you think that it would make sense? It has nothing to do with my life because my life was never really on reality TV. Okay. Um, yeah. You're kind of like signing up to have a bunch of exciting storylines, even if they're not really yeah, related I'm to your real not, life. I'm just not there in life. Um, mm. What I told Sharp, the only show I'd be interested in doing is Real Housewives, but even with that, I don't want my real family on TV. I just mm. don't. Um after, you know, being exposed to what I've been exposed to and seeing how it changes people and seeing, you know, how, what a tough skin you have to have um, just because people are so judgmental while they're sitting on their floor on their air mattress, you know, eating a can of sardines. They want to judge people that are in a position that they can never be in. I don't ever want my child or, you know, someone in my mother, my spouse, or whoever the case may be to be like, I didn't sign up for this. Why are they saying these things about me? Mm -hmm. You know, when I first got on Love and Hip Hop, with the first four, the first three weeks, I was mortified. I'm like, why would they think this? Why would they say this? And people are nasty and evil, and they just like, like you got to have a tough skin. Like you, if you don't have a tough, you would be suicidal reading some of this just grotesque, disgusting, despicable things that people say about someone they'll never meet. And for me, it's like. I can handle it, but I can handle like, it. Like to put my kid in that position Absolutely. feels fucked up. Yeah. I remember the fourth week that I was on Love and Hip Hop when those offers started coming in, the hosting gigs and the this and the that and the amount that I'm like, oh, say what you want, say what you want, you know. But my mom can't handle that. Mm -hmm. My mom, my mom to this day, like, I, mom, turn my notifications off, like, because if someone comes at you crazy for you trying to defend me. I'm going to look up their IP address and then we all going to be messed up, you know? And right. then like, so I, I just don't want to involve 
my family and that type of thing. So the re- everybody, oh, you need your own reality show. I don't want it. I don't want it. Yeah. Like me and my girl did the family vlog type stuff a little bit for a while and everything. But you can control that. Yeah. But then it's still like at a certain point, it's like, okay, why am I doing this? Like doing this, like taking your Sunday, hanging out with your family and also making it partially about like setting the camera up and filming a bunch of shit. If you don't have to do it to me, it's right. just, I would rather not do right. it and have right. my days with the family just be based on just having right. fun. You right. Know? Yeah. I respect people who kind of have to yeah. basically like whore out their family life in order to make money. I, I I understand that, you know, if I was in that position and I didn't have anything else going on, I'd probably be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have to do it. So yeah. I'm just not going to do it. You know, my daughter, she loves making little YouTube videos and, and she just does it on her own. Right. And I just made her YouTube channel two weeks ago. I don't know if it's, if it's been this case for this year, but um, like there was two consistent years where the, the highest paid YouTuber was this little boy named Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Like he's a Nickelodeon get, kid. He's getting too old, so they made a cartoon version of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, kind of like JoJo, right? Is that yeah, name? yeah, because she's like 16 or 17 yeah, she, no, or she's something. she's like 19 now, I think. Really? Yeah, because she was like a little kid YouTuber, yeah. and now she yeah. can't really. Yeah. And, and yeah. she's like a lesbian. She's like, yeah, got her she whole just, little thing. It was thing. a whole yeah. wild card. <laughs> I wonder what happened to, well, yeah, I wonder what happened to her channel, like if she still has. I'm pretty sure she does. It's probably still just her yeah. personality. Yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure she does. But, you know, so it's like there's a lot of money on the table, obviously. But, yeah. you know, I've never been, I'm just now getting into, you know, YouTube and posting videos and stuff, and people have been asking me to do it for years, like, um, I have a cooking show called because Felicia's, Kick- with Felicia's the t- Kitchen. With the TV stuff, it was kind of like you just couldn't really like find it within yourself to like do all that work yourself of setting the camera. Yeah, up like who the hell wants to do that? Right, you I kinda, get it done for me. Yeah, editing. Uh. But like then, like the thing that the thing that I realized that I'm missing off when I go on YouTube and Google like, oh, Kari wants to see a birthday party. Before I could even type the full name, a million videos pop up. Yeah, and people, t- it's just aggravates me they take clips from my live clips from my story clip and they're monetizing this yeah and it's like oh god okay like it's almost like well if i don't do it obviously everybody else is right so yeah, it's a catch-22 you know yeah. we, the, that's the era we live in so it is what it is definitely um okay so yeah what else you got coming up what are you excited about well again um as soon as there's this SAG strike is over. Right. I have movie and four shows that I've written, produced, and two of the shows I'm in, two of the shows I'm not. Um, I have a huge, huge announcement to make again when the strike is, is, is over. Um, I've partnered with some amazing people for a particular show that I'm just, I'm super excited about. So maybe when the strike's over, I'll come back to drop that bomb here. Oh, okay. Um, but again, be looking out for my single narcissist, please. It's coming next. I, I, I just feel like it's it colors so many relationships of so many friends and people that I know. I think it's just going to be super relatable. Uh, we're working on the visuals for that now. That's dropping in four weeks. Can't wait for that. Mm-hmm. And then um, my next book, Options Trading Tips from a Bad Bitch, is coming. That's dropping Black Friday. And then I also have my book for children, uh, Financial Literacy Tips for Good Kids. Mm. So we're doing like a whole financial literacy thing. And we want to start it early, like your first time learning about bills and debt and credit and all these things should not be when you're in the real world. You know, I feel like a Western education teaches you to be a worker, Mm. not to be um, entrepreneur, not to be successful. I really truly think that the higher ups are the agenda is to get rid of the middle class altogether. I think they want it to be the super rich and the super poor Mm -hmm. that gives more control. Um, You know, so I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so, you know, proactive about, just constantly educating. I wish I learned earlier what I know now. I would be so far ahead. And, you know, thank God I've been able to, you know, make quite a bit in a small period of time with the investing and, and things like that, you know, that I've learned to where, you know, I'm able to take the jobs I want to now. And whereas before it was like, oh, I got to get this job. I got to get this job. And I was like, mm, I don't need it. Mm-hmm. I can turn it down. Right. I take the jobs I want, not the ones, you know, the lights are going to be on. Definitely. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited about that. Oh, and, um, oh, just, this just in, um, Adam just offered me my own podcast. So that's coming soon. Well, <laughs> I was going to say, you did mention that. Is that something that you're kind of like looking at getting into? Well, like here's the thing. So, but bef- right before COVID hit me and Moniz, um, who was also on Love and Hip Hop r- with me, we started our own podcast mm-hmm. and this was before the whole big podcast era, but then COVID hit and we, 
the studio shut down that we were filming in and we couldn't get any other editors. We filmed like two or three episodes and it was just kind of, you know, the world was closed. Mm -hmm. So it was something that, that we had taken from this idea we created when we were on VH1 and they created this segment called Messiness and Mimosas. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's on VH1 on YouTube. You can Google it. We were the first to do it. And then they had other cast members do it, you know, years to come. I don't know if they still do it now or not, but we had created a show called the Clapback Recap. And um, again, like COVID kind of shut us down. Um, then I had pitched it at NBC Universal. They loved it. They were picking it up, but we did not have our releases from Love and Hip Hop. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how I got out of my contract. I didn't know that I needed one. Really? And it, it was a hard fight, but I got out of it. It was a hard, hard fight. It took years. Um, so anyway, cut to I have my daughter and I'm like, I'm gonna be home more. My husband buys all this podcast equipment. And, you know, I just kind of start recording. But then, like, I, I don't know. It's just, it, it was just, I'm, I'm at my house with my daughter. I don't want to have guests come into my house. And oh, I yeah. don't want to leave. So, you know, but I've had a million people ask me, like, we need a podcast. Can you give us a podcast? Please give a podcast. I've had some, you know, pretty big people reach out to me about hosting a podcast. But what I will tell you, after that sharp interview, now it's like, Girl, you have to do one. You have to do one. You have to do one. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw like the comments and stuff like that, but I mean, I get comments every day about everything, but I can honestly say this is probably that had a nerve. Oh man. <sighs> like I, I've, I've never seen so much love support from people. Like usually people try to find anything wrong with what I say. Mm -hmm. It was, it was just nothing but like positivity it's funny as soon as you mentioned the idea of doing something with No Jumper because you know how Joe Budden has had Melissa Ford on his podcast. So what's going on with that? Well, I'm not sure exactly like where it's at because uh -huh. I've heard there's a little bit of turmoil and yeah. everything. But it does occur to me that that would like to the people that would be like, oh, Joe got a, a legendary video vixen. So Adam goes and gets his own. Look at that. <laughs> Which Hey, I mean. It's not the worst idea I ever heard. I mean, I, don't, I, I can think of a lot worse. I mean, yeah, but uh, okay. The whole thing, my perspective on podcasts is because I've, I've done the thing where I've had, I've just like got somebody who, there was this guy, Long Beach Griffey, and we gave you him You just a got anybody like Sharp? Well, oh, okay, Sharp. I'm just teasing. In the streets. <laughs> but Sharp already had a reputation because he came on the podcast and it did crazy numbers. I, mean, I don't have a problem with Sharp. I'm just teasing, right, by okay. the way. But uh, <laughs> so when I, like I've done the thing, there was this guy, Long Beach Griffey. I gave him a podcast. He's got millions of subscribers. He's never done a podcast though. Mm. Gave him a podcast on here and it was just like him and his friends kicking it. And it didn't feel like the fans really got mm -hmm. into it because it's like, this is no jumper. If there's going to be somebody on the channel, they kind of have to like make sense in regards to me, I yeah. think where it's like, and I think it's, it's like that on a lot of different podcasts or networks or whatever, where it's like, if they're going to really like care about somebody, like the best things that we've had going on as a channel is basically when we have a bunch of people that it actually feels like friends and they mm. actually have like real relationships and like, you know, there there's ups and downs in those relationships where they can come on camera and kind of talk about it. But I don't know. That, that would be kind of the crazy thing because I'm just thinking about all our hosts and I'm like, oh, well, we already know how the Sharp and Masika dynamic works out. But I wonder how that could go. Yeah. yeah. Mm. How much do you know about drill music? I mean, I know a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I know a little bit about drill, a lot of bit about Mickey Mouse. Yeah. But I, <laughs> I don't feel like you have to know that much about like the music as long as you're kind of willing to like tap in. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm off the scene and on the scene at the same time. Mm. It's the it's a it's hard to kind of like like I said I, I I can tell you the latest cartoon that's popping, but no, okay. I also I also got my ears to <laughs> that Daniel Tiger be going <laughs> right, crazy, right, son. Right, period. <laughs> like we went to the Paw Patrol movie premiere. Period. Oh really? We just did. Wow. But then I'm also at you know the the, the adult premieres. My too. kid keeps asking about the Paw Patrol movie. Yeah, it comes out on the 29th, I think. I showed her uh, the Mario Brothers movie when we were in Hawaii. She was going crazy. How old for is that. she? Uh, almost three. Oh. Oh, oh, she's yeah, she's she talks crazy. about Mario so much, and you know what stage of her life she's in? Like, so there's a a girl next door that she hangs out with sometimes, and she's older, like a year older than her, and they hung out, and my kid realized that this other kid tries on dresses all the time. It's it's dress up all day, every day. So my girl ordered like five princess dresses yes. and shit, yeah. and now my kid literally gets out of bed and puts on a fucking pink. Princess Listen, Peach gown that is before my she even comes in to say hi to us. Favorite thing in the universe. 
the fact that my seven year old still wants to dress up in her costumes. Really? I like I'll order her a thousand of them because I like, you know, it 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 only lasts for so long. Mm. And then there's like there's a certain amount of time, then boom. They don't want it anymore. And all of a sudden, like, they want the latest sneaker and they want this, they want that. Mm-hmm. My daughter's like, Mom, can I get this? Co-? Yes, you can. You can wear whatever costume. Sure. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's the it's the sweetest age. You know what I like about it, too, though, is that she loves the whole princess thing, but she doesn't get that the whole thing with a princess is that they're, like, trying to find a prince or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, she doesn't Isn't that re- crazy? She doesn't really, like, know that boys exist or anything. Perfect. So it's like, and even though, like, the Mario movie with the princess in that movie, she's just hanging out with Mario. She's He's like a plumber. Like, she really, like, hired him or, like, yeah. enlisted him to help to save her kingdom. It's not like she's, like, falling in love with him or yeah. anything. So yeah. she's she's very, like, independent, but not I in, like, it. a weird way. Yeah, it's, it's all about keeping kids innocent. And if you think about it, like, if you think about all these, like, great fairy tales and princess stories, you don't realize you're older, but, like, it was all, like, a after a, a guy or after a girl. Exactly, like, yeah. But, you know, we didn't realize that as a kid, but that, that, that wasn't... But now a lot of the movies really kind of go out of their way to not make it like, oh, they're just, it's just like some girl and she's trying to find a guy to save her. Yeah, they go out of their way to throw in a um, non-binary oh, yeah. person or two dads kissing or two moms kissing. You're about to have a, a Cisco moment? Or who was it? It wasn't Cisco. Who, who did Gloria Valdez interview the other day? I don't know. I don't okay. know. I don't give a shit. Because um, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, like, keep kids kids. Right. I don't, right. I don't, I don't want to... I don't want my kid to see a mom... I don't want my kids to see kissing in a cartoon, period. Right. I don't care if it's Tom and Jerry or Tom and Samantha or, you know, I, I just don't think that we need to sexualize children, especially with with things that are confusing. Mm. You know, like it's easy to explain procreation when you like, oh, a mommy and a daddy can procreate and, you know, make the you don't have to sexualize that. You can just, you know, but like. When it when it's not scientifically, be able to, you, you now you have to start explaining things to children that they're not even thinking about. Children don't know anything about. Like there was a um, a cartoon. I don't remember what cartoon it was, but uh, one of the kids had two dads in the cartoon. Okay. And um, some some kid said something to my my daughter about it, and she was like, "What's wrong with that? I have two dads." <laughs> you know, in her mind, it, it was, it was nothing sexual about it. She's like, I have a dad and I have a stepdad. Right. You know, kids don't even think like that. I've yet to see like a Disney movie that I thought was too woke, but I'm not like fully uh, into it. Like I haven't seen a lot of them, so I don't really know what it's what's out there. You know, a lot of times it'll be on. We're not really paying attention because it's a cartoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was making dinner one day. And I just happened to look at the TV. I don't remember what it was. It was some fish, like fish. It was, it was like a Finding Nemo type cartoon, but it wasn't Finding Nemo. And... There was a girl fish that was saying, I want to go with you. And there was this big fish saying, you're going to come with me. And she's like, I don't want to go with you. And then she had little fish friends that were just kind of looking. And the fish, she, she tells him no. He takes her under his fin and swims off with her. Mm. And she's screaming, help, help, help. And then some another little fish swims up to one of her little guy friends and like, why didn't you help her? You just showed a woman being abducted against yeah, her will right, on a yeah. cartoon? Like, who writes this? Yeah. And it, I just so happened to be glancing you know, you know, I don't pay attention to the cartoons all the time because it's a cartoon. And I'm like, you just subliminally told children a woman can say no, a man can still grab her, and everybody can just watch. Right. And a cartoon with fish. On, what? Do you ever see this one, uh, The Princess and the Frog, I think it's called? I saw it last night. See, I haven't watched it in fully, but I've seen it. It's interesting because it's, it's basically like telling kids about like racism and income inequality because it's like these, it's like a, a, a black, dad and, and daughter and then a white dad and daughter and there's like the rich people and the poor people and their storylines are playing out side by side and then at some point the black girl becomes a frog and that oh. kind of colors a lot of it. I won't spoil Uh-oh. too much of it. But yeah, I was watching last as night. As I've seen parts, I've never watched the full thing. Yeah, I was I was tuned in last night and I thought that was pretty interesting because it's like See, important I'm, I'm, shit. I'm all, but I'm all for good life lessons. Yeah. I'm all for, you know, a little bit of a life lesson mixed with some entertainment. Maybe not a fish getting abducted against her will. No, for sure, yeah. No, but when you watch a lot of the older cartoons, too, like when I'm watching Pinocchio, it's like, holy shit, they're really showing them smoking and stuff. And which stuff they would that we never, never paid attention them. to. Yeah, never, which I never, never would have thought that, that was bad. Yeah. But I guess that's probably what made me think smoking was kind of badass. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Pinocchio did it. 
Yeah, or I think it might have been Geppetto. Popeye the Sailor Man or, or whatever Stromboli it was. or whatever, yeah. Pinocchio was all my kid talked about for a while. Really? Oh my gosh, she would not shut up about it constantly. And then, again, that's a, he's a liar. That's very true. He's just Bad a life lesson. I, I wish every time someone lied, their nose really grew. Well, not, let me not say that because we lie to our kids all the time. Yeah, right. Like, it would be hard to <laughs> I wish that it, what it, a lie I wish, is. like, every time your significant other lied. Mm. Only that. That would be great. I'm trying to think of like a defense mechanism that you could. Would you employ. have a long nose? No. No, I don't lie to her. Okay. Not I gotta believe that. I gotta. Nothing I gotta, significant. I gotta believe that. Yeah. But you gotta lie to the kid all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> That's terrible. It's true, yeah, but it's terrible. It's true. It's weird, but <laughs> you have to lie to the kid constantly. Yeah. If that if that was enforced strictly, it would be tough. Yeah. 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 And a lot of things would change. Um. Okay. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. And thank you for staying in your seat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should storm out of here. Actually. Yeah, let's, let's storm on off. That would be great for the content. I think uh, we should just do it. Why not? Yeah. Let's fuck just, this. On the count of three, fuck I'm this shit. Can I flip the table? Masika, no jumper. Hey. Get the hell out of here. What the fuck? Yeah. Fuck this shit. Everybody. No, you have to stay, you have to stay there oh, and wait, yell at me say. for 20 wait, minutes. Wait, <laughs> Where are you going, Adam? Adam. What? Really? That, this has got to be the clip that we play, too. <laughs> this was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.